My grandfather, Eric Burgost, never talked about World War II. I could tell just by looking at him that he was still haunted by the memories. It pains me to say, however, my grandfather was a German soldier during the war, but was drafted and didn't choose the fight. I initially thought this fact alone was why he never talked about the war, but I was wrong. After he passed, I helped my mother clean out his house. While going through some of his belongings, I discovered an old journal my grandfather kept, which contained an unpublished memoir recounting his wartime experiences. While he didn't commit any atrocities, at least according to his memoir, my grandfather encountered something just as sinister. I've translated a section describing this very incident, one I know stuck with him the rest of his life. He titled this section, Das Armband, The Bracelet. He probably never wanted his account told, but I feel my grandfather's World War II story is one that needs to be shared. Das Armband The year I spent fighting to aid the Wehrmacht's eastern expansion exposed me to some of the worst carnage I ever witnessed. That's why I was elated when my infantry regiment was transferred to Norlage, a village in northern France. Save the ever-constant threats from local resistance groups and RAF raids, the quiet scenic countryside was a welcome change. The townspeople, although naturally resentful towards us, seemed to know their place and were seldom unruly. What mattered most to the peasants is exactly what did before our valiant conquest, making a living. Something that must go on for these people, war or no war. Our district's commanding officers suspected certain businesses and residences in Norlage were secretly being used as safe houses and outposts. One particular establishment, the Tavern Cotter, a popular spot among both the townspeople and troops. I and some of my fellow soldiers were regulars at the tavern and became acquainted with the owners, Jean and Elise Niveau. Madame Elise was warm and personable, who took time to learn everyone's name that stepped into a tavern and always made you feel welcome. She was scorned by some locals for doing so, but Madame Elise acted very motherly towards the younger German soldiers. We think it's because she knew we weren't here by choice, or was trying to have us let our guards down. Despite ultimately being a conquered peasant, she was on good terms with us, but knew our sentiments could shift instantly. Monsieur Jean, on the other hand, was a sad, cold, and unfriendly human being. He spent most of his time behind the bar or one of the back rooms, rarely interacting with customers, and treated his wife like a dog. I remember seeing the pain and sorrow in Madame Elise's eyes some days, as she fought to keep a smile across her face. I was at the tavern with my regular band of soldiers, Privates Bursch, Schultz, and Lance Corporal Welch. We were seated at our usual table, nestled in one of the tavern's corners, while waiting for Sergeant Jaeger, who wanted to share some news with us away from the barracks. Jaeger arrived shortly after we were seated and was quickly greeted by Madame Elise. After she departed, Jaeger motioned for us to lean in closer so nobody else could hear him speak. One of Jaeger's contacts claimed that Niveau's was hiding a priceless gold diamond encrusted bracelet, purportedly dating back to the Capetean dynasty. For what purpose are they storing it? Schultz asked. A post war nest egg, funds for the resistance, it doesn't matter, Jaeger replied. They're sitting on a fast fortune that's ripe for the taking, and I say we make that taking ours. We were interrupted by Fiona, one of the tavern's waitresses who brought us our round of drinks and made some coy small talk with our table. She was hard to miss with a slim proportionate figure, long curly black hair, luscious red lips, and radiant light green eyes. Fiona was always the most attractive and desirable woman in the tavern, but there was something about her I honestly detested. I learned she took men to a room upstairs for the right price and was having an affair with Monsieur Jean. Her immorality aside, I could never adequately identify what specifically incited my resentment. And if your source is incorrect? I asked after Fiona parted from our table, my eyes narrowing at Jaeger. 
When have my contacts misinformed me? Jaeger quickly replied. They know better, Corporal. Jaeger unveiled a plan that involved us getting rich and escaping this heinous war. After the tavern closes one upcoming night, he wanted to break in and swipe the bracelet for ourselves. We would then head to the depot, dispose of our uniforms, and catch a train to Switzerland. Welch confirmed his uncle owned a large estate near Bern, where we could hide out and sell the bracelet after the war ends. Desertion is punishable by death, Birch stated apprehensively. While we all glanced around the table, gauging each other's reactions to Jaeger's proposal. Only if we get caught, Jaeger confidently replied. Everyone at this table experienced this war's carnage firsthand. We have all sacrificed for the Reich. We're all competent, honourable men that fought alongside each other and deserve better. We would be fools for passing on such a bountiful gain and a chance to emaciate ourselves as pawns at the behest of our superiors. Before Jaeger could continue, Welch asked if it was wise to disclose the pivotal details of the very tavern we intended to raid. Jaeger's response was so cunning, it expunged any doubt I had about his plan going awry. The safest place to plot against your target is right under their noses. When he didn't receive any objections, Jaeger said his contact confirmed the bracelet was hidden within one of the tavern's bedroom walls. Madame Elise was completely unaware of the jewel, or that Monsieur Jean and Fiona were apparently planning an eloping with the bracelet. In addition, Jaeger said he could finalize all the necessary arrangements, such as disguises and transportation to the depot. He demands a cut of the loot for his help, Jaeger said of his contact. So we will have to dispose of him at some point. He's just a peasant. The darkening of Jaeger's face insinuated how serious he was, along with ramifications, should any of us retread. While explaining the final details, a loud, pop-like cracking rang through the tavern, causing everyone to fall silent. We looked toward the bar, just as Madame Elise collapsed in a heap onto the floor, tightly holding the side of her face. Monsieur Jean's large, beefy arm was thrown across his chest, his massive hand outstretched. After striking his wife, he started viciously scolding Madame Elise about her doing what she was told. Schultz and I reacted by shooting up from our seats. However, Jaeger quickly halted us. We need not intervene in local affairs, gentlemen, Jaeger explained calmly. We cannot afford any unwanted attention given our upcoming mission. I knew the sergeant was correct. We watched as Madame Elise struggled back to her feet, keeping her hand firmly pressed over where she was struck as blood seeped from her nose and lips. She fought back tears before fleeing into the kitchen, after which Monsieur Jean stomped into the back room. I fought to contain my escalating anger when I saw Fiona giggling, who was genuinely amused by what just happened. Still wearing that infuriating smirk across her face, she nonchalantly followed Monsieur Jean into the back room. Although the mood was clearly dampened, the tavern's boisterous chatter slowly returned, we all exhibited varying degrees of dismay and disgust after watching a largely burly figure like Monsieur Jean ferociously strike his frail, delicate wife, who was one of the few townspeople that always showed us kindness. I was clearly the most distraught over seeing Monsieur Jean strike his wife, but became content when I thought how especially gratifying it would be to take something so valuable from such a horrid, pompous man. Three days passed before Jaeger signaled his plan was ready to commence. We were to rendezvous around midnight, we were to rendezvous around midnight at an abandoned barn not too far from the tavern. I left the barracks with Bursch, who professed his doubts and apprehension about Jaeger's plan, along with the fatal consequences of being caught. While cutting through a patch of dense woods, Bursch asked if I trusted him not to speak a word of this to anyone if he returned to the barracks. Upon realizing his intent to retread, I was forced to kill him. I told Bursch he was right about having his doubts and gave him my blessing, which was enough to let his guard down. 
The second he turned his back, I sank the entire blade of my dagger into the back of his skull. I killed many during the war, but Bursch was the first time I ever used a knife. The feeling was much more personal and intimate than a gun, which was something I never dwelled on until recently. Killing Bursch also meant a bigger cut to the rest of us, which was probably why nobody seemed profoundly impacted when I relayed the news. The others, especially Jaeger, knew it had to be done. Those were the consequences. We stuck to the shadows when making our way to the tavern, which took us longer to reach, but ensured we weren't seen. Upon arriving, Jaeger instructed Schultz and myself to enter through the back, while he and Welch went through the front. As we crept into the back lot, Schultz and I noticed a light and some slight movement coming from the shed. I immediately knew who would be inside at this time of night. We warily approached and peered through one of the shed's windows to see the backside of Monsieur Jean standing awkwardly hunched over a table directly above Fiona's sprawled body. Monsieur Jean's pants were at his ankles and Fiona's bare writhing legs were outstretched. It was obvious what they were doing. The sight of Fiona's slim body was admittedly an arousing and transfixable spectacle, but I managed to pull us away and told Schultz to follow my lead. Withdrawing our pistols, I kicked the shed door open as we stormed inside, demanding Monsieur Jean reveal the bracelet's location. You waste my time! I barked when Monsieur Jean empathetically denied knowing anything about the bracelet. We know about the jewel. Need I remind you all arts and riches are property of the Führer? You stand in contempt of those laws by withholding such valuables. Tell us the room where you conceal the treasure, and you will be left unharmed. Outraged at our unprecedented entry, Monsieur Jean became imprudently aggressive. You break into my home, my business, make false accusations and demands, threats with no attestation. Monsieur Jean barked while frantically pointing at me. His growing anger, disregard for authority, and sense of control Monsieur Jean arrogantly seemed to believe he had reignited my hatred and boiling fury. In an emblematic gesture, I shifted my gun toward Fiona and fired a bullet that struck directly between her legs. She released a blood-curdling shriek and recalled in pain as blood spilled across the table. Monsieur Jean shouted in terror, asking what I had done and was about to grab Fiona, during which I quickly fired a second shot, striking him in the same intimate area. You are in no place to lecture us, I said while slowly walking up to Monsieur Jean who wailed in agony and struggled to stay on his feet, using the table as support. You don't understand, Monsieur Jean shakily uttered before finally collapsing. What I understand is how undeserving you are of your kind loving spouse and the pricelessness of that bracelet, I said while pinning Monsieur Jean's head against the ground with my boot. Corporal, Schultz cried out, making me take my eyes off Monsieur Jean only to see the bloody table strike us with ferocious speed. The impact launched us into the wall and shattered the table. Groggy and dazed from the strike, I looked up to see Fiona's contorting body. Her torso was rapidly bloating, while her face was stretched unnaturally wide, appearing as if it was about to rip apart and form two additional heads. She took deep, grumbly breaths that barely sounded human, and started making stiff, mechanical, stomping steps in our direction. Before I could retreat, Schultz rose to his feet, brandishing a metal pole, and he released a frantic battle cry and blindly charged toward Fiona, who instinctively grabbed the pole when Schultz attempted to swing. Clenching his neck with her other hand, she lifted Schultz's struggling body, her tightened grip crushing his windpipe and reducing Schultz's screams to a faint, hiss-like gargle. Trapped in a fear-induced, paralytic trance, I watched Fiona clench the skin beneath Schultz's chin and slowly peel the layer off his face. Schultz's limbs squirmed and twitched until his entire face was torn off, after which Fiona proceeded to savagely tear off his arms and chunks of torso. I finally managed to utter a no that caused her to drop Schultz's dismembered body. 
As I raced to my feet, Fiona's morphing head looking upwards and made a twitch-like gesture, which seemed to snap the wooden support beam running across the ceiling in two and bring down the shed's entire roof. While lifting myself from the rubble, I froze upon hearing those deep, growl-like breaths as Fiona, or whatever it was, effortlessly shifted through the fallen debris and exit the dismantled shed. I heard her slowly stomp across the lot, followed by another loud crash from her ripping the tavern's back door off its hinges. I waited for the silence to return before emerging out of the rubble. Despite injuries to my arm, leg and back, something shifting in the debris caught my attention, which I realized was Monsieur Jean. The wooden beam impaled him through his abdomen, blood splurted from his mouth and smashed nose each time he attempted to exhale. He clearly didn't have much time left, but wanted his last words to be heard. I loved my wife. Monsieur Jean weakly gasped in between bursts of bloody coughs. I had no choice but to bind myself to that evil, that incarnation, for my beloved Elise's sake. Monsieur Jean spent his final moments describing the morbid pact he was forced to make. Two years ago, Madame Elise was severely ill and on the brink of death. The entity first appeared before Monsieur Jean in the form of an elderly man herding a bull and ram while he was walking down a nearby country road one night. After affirming its vile nature, the being said it knew Madame Elise was in grave condition and made a proposition. She would be cured of her illness if Monsieur Jean adhered to the being's will. When he reluctantly agreed, the being made Monsieur Jean swear a blood oath that officially bound him to the entity, who said it would return in a different form. It reappeared at the tavern 30 days after Madame Elise's recovery in the form of a seductive, beautiful young woman. The being said Monsieur Jean willed it to exclusively unleash his bodily fervors. He was forbidden from ever having intercourse with or show his wife any form of affection. Passing it as the waitress we all knew as Fiona, Monsieur Jean catered to the entity's malicious depravity for over two years while being painstakingly forced to neglect his wife. When I asked Monsieur Jean the being's name, he fearfully uttered one word. Asmodee. You can't imagine my pain, being forced to cast my beloved wife aside. Taking this monster far and away from Elise was the ultimate sacrifice I was willing to make. Monsieur Jean sputtered during his final seconds of life. But you sabotaged my plan, nullified our pact. I watched the life escape from Monsieur Jean's face as his body went limp. There was no time to reflect on everything he just revealed when a shrill, agonizing shriek came from inside the tavern. I staggered across the lot and entered through the back doorway. The dark corridor led to a private dining room which was in complete disarray. Among the smashed furniture, shattered glass and porcelain, I noticed chunks of flesh, severed limbs and human entrails strewn across the floor. I spotted shreds of a German uniform, along with a Lance Corporal insignia, which was all I needed to deduce these were Welch's remains. I felt my stomach churn and was about to vomit. When I turned to leave the room, the door I came in from slammed shut, replacing my nausea with panic when it wouldn't open. I turned back, just in time, to see the door leading to the tavern's front door slowly creak open. I cringed as I slowly crept across the room, each of my steps signified by the crunching of glass and porcelain shards across the floor. My limbs were shaking as fast and uncontrollably as my heart beat. I slowly entered the front room, which was barely illuminated by a pair of overhead lights and a glass lantern on the bar. Almost every table and chair were also overturned or destroyed. I drew up my pistol and torch pointing both in the same direction, despite my frantically shaking hands. 
the torch's light revealed a macabre scene. One of the server's bodies lay slumped in the corner of a narrow, L-shaped staircase leading to the tavern's second floor. A gaping void was where the body's face should be, and a uniform's white button-down shirt was blooded and littered with deep tears while her entrails were spilled across the staircase's platform. The front room's far side had chunks of flesh, entrails, limbs and blood smeared across the floor, along with a nude, limbless and headless torso propped against an overturned table. My heart sank when I shined the torch upon Madame Elise. Her lifeless body was folded backwards like a piece of paper over a smashed table. A massive fist-like chunk of her throat was ripped out, leaving her head barely attached to her body by a slim strip of skin. Her entire forehead was smashed in, and pieces of her ribs and spine were pierced through her skin around the crease of her backwardly bent torso. I could still make out the welt on her face from where she was struck by Monsieur Jean, who I now know was trying to protect his wife. As I started walking up to Madame Elise's body, a creaking noise coming from the bar's opposite end made me quickly show my torch in that direction, where I glanced upon Jaeger's motionless body that protruded out from behind the bar. He lay next to the kitchen doorway, along with a pair of legs from what I thought was another corpse, but realized they belonged to Jaeger, whose body was ripped in half. Between my smothering lightheadedness, rapidly beating heart, and violently churning stomach, I was on the brink of succumbing to the unfathomable surroundings, when I noticed something glimmer in Jaeger's hand. The bracelet. I cautiously retrieved the jewel from Jaeger's rigid grip, and thoroughly inspected it with my torch. Aside from the blood coating its surface, the bracelet was smooth, flawless, and lined with a half dozen diamonds that were at least three carats. The bracelet had a small engraving that read Capet, 1752, with the family's signature insignia of a shield with three fleurs. The bracelet was undoubtedly genuine, which made me forget where I was for a brief second. While enamored with a priceless jewel, the kitchen door slowly opened. Those deep, grumbly breaths broke the timid silence. Looking up, I stumbled backwards and fell to the floor as my widened, terror-filled eyes comprehended the fearsome entity towering over me. I saw Asmodee in its true form. The nude being stood nearly seven feet tall and had a bloated, chunky torso of blotchy, pale, reddish peach skin. His chunky neck supported three conjoined, skinless faces, one of a ram, the swollen face of a man, and a bull, all containing blank, glazed expressions in their black, beady eyes. The demon stood on two slim, bird-like legs with thick, sharp talons and filled the room with a piercing odor of decay and sulfur. Unable to take my eyes off the being, I watched it curiously cant its head while I was observed by its three contorted faces. It stepped up alongside Jaeger's body and released a deep, scraping hiss before glancing down at its upper half. The demon lifted and turned Jaeger's torso so his limp, dangling head faced my direction. It then slowly sank and wiggled its claw-tipped appendages into Jaeger's back, causing his body to convulse before he sprang back to life. I nearly lost consciousness from the utter abhorrence and astonishment as Jaeger released a raspy groan, his unnaturally widened eyes staring directly at me. It hurt, Jaeger croakily gasped, his words coated in pure excruciation that sent a sharp, debilitating chill down my spine as the sounds of squishy crunching from the entity's twisting fingers digging deeper into Jaeger's backside filled my ears. Make it stop. Make it stop. Jaeger's words quickly transitioned into a constant, elongated moan that escalated into a sharp, agonizing scream. The vehemently harrowing suffering in Jaeger's voice and face broke me out of the entity's mesmerizing hold over me. I blindly aimed my pistol 
and emptied the clip, hoping to end Jaeger's suffering. I hit Jaeger several times, who was unaffected and continued his heightened screams. One of my rounds ricocheted and struck the gas lantern of the bar, which instantly ignited that side of the tavern. In response to my shots, Asmodee grabbed the top of Jaeger's head with its spare hand, tearing off and crushing his entire forehead like a crumpled piece of paper. Jaeger's screams persisted until the being pulled its fingers from Jaeger's back, in which the life once again vacated his body. As the fire spread, I tried crawling across the front room, but heard the demon quickly close in on me with his thumping steps. The being lifted me off the ground and turned my body so my face was mere inches from its three. The abomination uttered three words. Sanguinum tempus vignette. In a sunken, gravelly voice, before flinging me through the back room door. The impact dazed and made me too disoriented to move. My blurry vision faded in and out as the fire's glow intensified, making me certain I would burn to death. Right when the flames became visible from where I lay, I heard voices speaking in German and saw three blurry figures burst into the tavern. They were German soldiers that raced over after hearing the commotion and dragged me out in time. When questioned about what happened that night, I claimed to barely remember anything, but stated we were ambushed by resistance fighters. The war didn't last long for me after I recovered from my injuries. I was placed in a new regiment, but was captured by Allied troops shortly afterwards and put in a POW camp. For me, this was both a blessing and a curse. While I was no longer on the front lines, I fought my own internal battles with the scarring memories of that fateful night. I now know the reality of what evils exist in this world. Evils that exploit the weak and vulnerable in ways far worse than anything we as humans can comprehend. I don't know if I'll ever again encounter Asmodee. Perhaps I won't. If it knows the torment, I continuously suffer after that night's memories, which are forever embedded in my mind. My grandfather drew detailed sketches of the demonic entity and bracelet in the journal which were as chilling as they were captivating. When I went to show my mother the memoir's translated excerpt, she happened to be going through the contents inside my grandfather's safety deposit box. I think you'd like this, my mother excitedly told me before I could say anything and handed me a worn manila envelope. There was no mention of it in the will or anywhere else, but it seems like something of your grandfather's that you would cherish. A sharp chill ran down my spine when I opened the envelope and immediately recognized the item inside. The bracelet, the very one described in my grandfather's memoir. Dad, Dad, I saw a zombie. I was in the kitchen making tea when my little girl came rushing in. She ran through the back door so fast she almost tripped up the step. I poured boiling water from the kettle into my mug, hardly looking up. Oh yeah? Yeah, I did. Its face was all pale and messed up. It was gross, Dad. I put the kettle back and picked up the milk, sighed inwardly. I really had to be more careful about what I watched on the TV in the evening. Rosie had a habit of sneaking downstairs in the night, and last week, she caught me watching The Walking Dead of all things. She's had zombies on the brain ever since. I keep telling her they're not real, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. Sweetheart, what did we say about zombies? I scooped the tea bag out of the mug and dumped it in the bin. You know, if you keep talking about them, that is going to get in trouble with mummy again. Yeah, but I saw one. I know, darling, but I already checked the back garden twice yesterday, and I can promise you, it's a zombie-free zone. No, not in the back garden. 
Hmm? I didn't see it in the back garden. I had the mug half raised to my lips, but now I put it down again. I turned to look at Rosie. Her hair was windswept, and her little cheeks were red, as if she'd been running. Sweetheart, I put on my best stern, dad's not happy voice. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest with me. Have you been playing along the path out back again? I didn't really need to ask the question, because I already knew the answer. Rosie is allowed to play in the garden on her own, and sometimes, if she asks us permission first, we let her ride a bike along the path at the back of our house. The one that runs past all the neighbors' back gardens. But that's all we allow her to do. This area is pretty safe, but these days, you can never be too careful. There was a burglary a couple of roads over a few months back, and last year, someone was mugged on the high street. Several years ago, a few towns over, a little boy even went missing. That was quite a long way from here, of course, but it made national news for a few days until the search fizzled out. And it made a lot of parents more cautious. Rosie's getting older now, and she's an adventurous girl. But still, you have to have boundaries. And on a few occasions lately, Rosie's been crossing those boundaries, riding a bike further than she should, not coming in straight away when we call her, sneaking out the back gate when she's only meant to be playing in the garden. As I watched Rosie now, I noticed her face growing redder. She looked away from me, down at the kitchen floor, and scuffed her feet. Dad, I only went a little way down, she said. I promise. I was chatting to Mr. Henderson because I saw him in his back garden. I said hello and made him jump. I sighed. So there it was. Mr. Henderson was Rosie's zombie. Yesterday, it was the postman, and the day before that, it was a different neighbor. I took a sip of tea and shook my head. Mr. Henderson was, in fairness, a better candidate than the others. The guy lives on his own, and he looks about a hundred years old. Moles all over his face, skin like a deflated balloon. Whenever we chatted over the garden fence before, though, he'd always seem nice enough, just a bit lonely. I couldn't have Rosie going around calling him a zombie. Listen to me, sweetheart. I know you didn't go far or anything, but I don't want you... I came right back after two, Dad, Rosie interrupted. She was staring up at me now, blue eyes large and pleading. I promise, and I even said no when Mr. Henderson offered me an ice cream, because I know you don't like me taking stuff from strangers. I opened my mouth to respond, then paused. He offered you ice cream? Yeah, but I said no. Mr. Henderson really wanted me to come in and have one, but I told him I had to get home, and then I came straight back here to tell you I'd seen a zombie and I... Rosie was babbling now, her voice whirring like a motor, but I'd stopped listening. My mind was still stuck on something she'd said a moment before. Mr. Henderson really wanted me to come in and have one. I took another sip of tea and frowned. That wasn't good. I didn't mind the neighbors chatting to my little girl, but I didn't like the thought of them inviting her in. Not without us there. Not even if they were just kind, lonely old men. I made up my mind to go round and visit Mr. Henderson later, and to tell him that myself. Kindly, of course, but firmly. In the end, though, I didn't get a chance. Because a few moments after I'd had the thought, Rosie said something else. Something that pushed everything else from my mind and ended any idea I might have about going over to Mr. Henderson's house. She said something that made me feel cold. Daddy, please don't stop me playing in the garden. I promise I won't sneak out again. I don't want the zombie to get me. Rosie, I'm not going to stop you playing in the garden, but you have to make me a couple of promises too. First, promise me you'll stop going around calling people zombies. Mr. Henderson may be old, but he's not one of the living dead. Rosie frowned. I didn't. What do you mean you didn't? You just ran in here a moment ago calling him one. 
No, I didn't. Mr. Henderson's not a zombie. I saw the zombie in his house, but it wasn't him. I frowned. I had the mug raised to my lips to take another sip of tea. But now, I put it down again. What do you mean, sweetheart? You saw someone else in his house? Yeah, the zombie, Dad. I could see it pressed against his little basement window while I was talking to him. Cold fingers ran up my spine. What? Yeah, it was really scary. His face was all bashed up and bloody, and his mouth was open, like it was screaming at me. But do you know what confused me most, Dad? I tried to keep my voice steady. What? Well, I didn't realize kids could be zombies too. I thought it was only grown-ups, but I guess I must have been wrong. Because the one in Mr. Henderson's basement looked just like a little boy. It can be quiet at the top of a mountain. It's a sort of quiet that you don't even really notice. For me, that's what I enjoy the most. Just silence. I spend so much time cramped up in some dingy corner shop watching a trickle of people come in just to buy tobacco, beans or booze that standing there with my arms open feels like the greatest thing in the world. I guess, along with that, there really isn't much else to do around here. So, hiking's just about the only hobby I have. It's been months since I last went up there though. You find the weirdest things hanging around the woods and there have been rumours of a big cat up there since I was a kid. I once saw an eyeball. No explanation, no context, just an eye lying in the middle of the track. At the time, I figured it was a sheep's eye, but it didn't much look like one. Last time I went up, the weather turned lousy halfway there. It started with a drop in temperature, and it was like the sun had been put on a dimmer. One by one, I felt icy little pricks of water stab at my skin, and... Just as the first gust of wind started tugging at my coat, I realized it was time to turn back home. Before I turned a hundred feet, the whole sky opened up and I had to stumble my way home through a wall of water, flinching at the growing peals of thunder behind me. Anyway, I got part way down when I saw something sticking out of the dirt. I'd come off a muddy path onto a gravel lane used by farmers to reach their flocks up in the hills. And it would have been easy to miss the little bit of black plastic, except something about it looked odd. I don't know how the brain does it, but somehow, even through all the rain, and with it mostly buried in muck, I recognised it as a USB stick, even from quite a distance. I took it, scraped it off, and stared at the brandless, all-black plastic drive, wondering how the hell it had ended up halfway down a mountain. It didn't have a size, but I hoped it would be big. A big enough USB stick could go for some cash online, and if not, I could find some use for it myself. And, of course, there was a kind of voyeurism to find as well. I mean, I was curious as to what was on it, just like anyone else would be. I hoped to God I wouldn't plug it in and find it chock full of nasty porn or snuff films. It certainly seemed like someone had gone to great lengths to get rid of it, but that didn't deter me from wanting to see what was in it anyway. Nearby, lightning flashed, and the thunder was so deafening I cried out. I took stock of my surroundings and suddenly realized it wasn't very smart to be stood out in the open holding a piece of wet metal. So I took the stick away and focused on hauling ass back home. By the time I stumbled up the moldy stairway that led to my flat, I had forgotten all about the USB stick and just fell down on my sofa, watching whatever crap was on at the time. It wasn't until a few hours later, when I was peeling my damp jeans off my legs, one at a time, that I felt the little stick in my back pocket. I gave it a quick clean, and plugged it into my laptop, finding myself surprised when it actually worked. It took a fair amount of clicking and whirring, but eventually, a new explorer window popped open, and I found new folders. One or two were filled with some messed up hash files I couldn't open, but one folder was called 
Ritcoin and had a .exe with the same name. The program took up most of the 256GB storage space and had a black default console for the icon. For a moment, I weighed up the pros and cons of it being a virus, but eventually gave into curiosity and opened it. At first, nothing happened. Then, a small window popped open and text scrolled across the screen. May your wealth be writ upon your flesh, it read. Let us see what you are made of. Remaining funds, £128. To withdraw, please enter account number. I don't know why, but something about it struck me as odd. I got the weird sense it was being written live, the way the letters had been typed out on screen one by one. I wondered if it was some dodgy dark web thing, and the whole Ritcoin name made me think of cryptocurrency. At first, I laughed at the idea of entering my account number, thinking it was a scam. But then I remembered, I didn't have a penny to my name and my credit score was in the gutter. If anyone wanted to steal my identity, they were welcome to it. And what with all those stories of people making so much money off crypto, I figured what the hell and plugged my details in. Sure enough, I checked a few minutes later and £128 had been deposited into my account. I laughed because despite the windfall, it all just went into paying off my unplanned overdraft. But still, I thought, money is money. Before noticing that the program had updated itself, now the screen read, Remaining funds, zero pounds. Let's see what you are made of. Something about those words didn't feel like a dare or even a challenge, but more like an overt threat. It was the kind of thing I would picture Jeffrey Dahmer saying as he approached the victim. Thinking about it, I wound up getting so nervous I bit my lip hard enough to draw blood. Ow! I hissed, before wiping the little nick on the inner skin of my lip and staring at a trickle of crimson on my thumb. When I looked back up at the computer a moment later, I saw that something else had been written while I wasn't looking. A little taste. Remaining funds. Five pounds. Oh, I muttered quietly, feeling the cogs turning around in my head. It must just keep generating cash over time. The only thing was, I didn't know if this thing would make five grand or five pounds a day, or what. So, I decided to put the idea of winning the lottery out of my head, so I could get to sleep and a little peace. That morning, I awoke and forgot all about Ritcoin, instead going to work like I normally would. Even when I returned home, I still didn't remember the program and went straight into a Skype call with my son. Most of it was like normal, I guess. He didn't have much interest in me, but I tried hard to show an interest in him. Apparently, he was doing a race in the week for some kind of charity, and him and the other kids would all get to dress up. It made me laugh, and I asked if he'd like me to come, but he shook my head. Can you help though, Daddy? He asked. Help how? The children in need need money. They don't have clean water or clean clothes, and Mrs. Rattle says most of them don't even have an Xbox. Oh? I nodded. Uh, how much do you think I should give? I guess I could give a pound or two. That's how much we gave when I was a kid. Tommy's dad gave 50 pounds, he said, and I noticed how he was looking at his hands and not me. I remember that look of disappointment. It was how I looked to my parents when I was his age. I'll figure it out, I said. It's only right to help people in need. Is that your father? His mother asked as she passed, a load of laundry in her arms. I took a deep breath to steady myself while she spoke to my son. Two minutes, sunshine. I just need to speak with him real quick, she said. Why don't you go pop your pajamas on and mummy will be with you in a minute. Her profile appeared on screen as she took the phone away from him. Hi, Craig, she said. Look, I want to speak with you because there's a school field trip coming up. Oh? Yeah, she said. I know it's not ideal, but I think I can cover it by myself. Where's he going? I asked. It's skiing, in France. It's optional, of course, but some of the other kids have noticed that, 
Well, his clothes aren't as nice, and his phone's a little older, and... I know, I nodded. It's tough. Yeah, which is why I think it's important he goes on this trip. I don't want him to miss out on nice stuff just because of money. Not like we had to growing up. So, I'm going to start saving already. But ideally, I could use a little of your help with this. How much? I'd say... 400 pounds? Jesus Christ, I groaned, momentarily burying my face in my hands. What is this school doing? A day out to a theme park used to be good enough for us. It's voluntary, she hissed. If you're going to be a dick about it, I'll just tell him you said he can't go. No, don't do that, I grimaced. Just... Just give me a few days and I'll see what I can do. Can you put him back on? I just sent him to bed, she said, sounding awfully indignant. We were speaking. I didn't even say goodnight. I hardly ever see him. Jesus Christ, Craig. He's going down for the night. Do you want him to go wake him up just so you can feel like a real... I hung up there and then, ending the call and feeling my skin momentarily flush red with anger. After a few steady breaths, I returned to my laptop. The memory of Rick Coin suddenly large in my mind. Eagerly, I waited for my laptop to wake up while I foolishly let my head run away with thoughts of having it made me thousands and thousands of pounds. Remaining funds. Five pounds. It flashed. Damn it! I screamed in anger, slamming my hand down onto the desk. So much for the goddamn money tree! What a thumping good time, the screen flashed each letter appearing with great deliberacy. Remaining funds, £25. I sat there for a moment, soothing the underside of my fist, wondering what the hell it meant. My laptop didn't even have a webcam, so it wasn't like some hacker could see me. For a moment, I told myself it was a coincidence, but I couldn't stop myself driving my thumbnail into my palm in a bid to calm my thoughts. Even as I did so, the screen updated. Hardly a deep impression. Remaining funds, £25 and 5 pence. Oh my god, I muttered, and like a light bulb going off, it hit me. I slammed my hand back down onto the table, immediately regretting it when the now bruised flesh struck wood for a second time. I cried out louder than before and cried on my throbbing hand while the screen updated again. Let's avoid repetition. May your wealth be writ upon your flesh. Let us see what you are made of. Remaining funds, 30 pounds and five pence. Okay, I muttered, speaking to myself, and then, without thinking, I started muttering, 400, 400, 400, 400. I took my other hand and went to hit the table once more when I took further notice of the warning. Let's avoid repetition, it had read. Something about it made me nervous, and I started looking around the room for other ideas. Four hundred, I muttered, again and again, as I scanned the empty takeaway boxes and piles of dirty laundry. I so desperately needed the money, and I couldn't stop myself thinking of whether I could use the program to make thousands, maybe even tens of hundreds of thousands, so that I could escape my hellhole flat. But nothing was forthcoming. So, I returned to the table and did the next thing that came to my mind. I headbutted it. But, like an idiot, I wound up half hesitating at the last moment, which just meant I sort of lifted my face up a little bit before inertia carried my skull the rest of the way down. In one swift move, I avoided slamming my forehead onto the table, and instead slammed my face into it. Ah, Christ! I groaned, immediately crating my smashed nose. My mouth filled with the acrid and metallic taste of blood, and already I could feel one of my lips starting to swell. The whole thing had hurt about ten times more than I imagined, and I worried if I'd end up walking around for weeks looking like I'd been mugged. But at the same time, I couldn't stop myself from taking a peek at the laptop screen. Face up to the challenge. Remaining funds, £140, 5 pence. For the rest of the night, I stayed up wondering about the rules of this little game. I wondered if I could put a thumbtack in my shoe and just slowly accumulate pennies throughout the day. I wondered if it paid more for blood, pain or just injury. What about disease? 
thing is, it's hard to injure yourself in constantly new ways. I tried a few other little things, jabbing myself with a fork, kicking the chair leg to stub my toe, and found that this thing hated repetition. I needed to keep it new and fresh. I even nicked myself with a small razor with the bathroom door shut, and found it still, somehow, knew what I was doing. It only earned me a fiver, but every little helps, right? It took me another three days to get the 400 pounds I needed, and it was a painful few days. I didn't want to do anything that would be permanent, so I took my time, thinking of what to do, and while I absolutely hated it, messing around with knives and needles seemed to be the best bet. Anything that dealt with soft flesh worked well, because I had plenty of spots to choose from, and I figured it'd heal easier over time. Ultimately, I wanted to avoid another broken nose, since not only did it make me look like an idiot, whose excuses never sounded quite right, but also, it bloody hurt. For a long, long time afterwards, the whole of my face throbbed like an open sore. At least when I pushed the safety pin through the flesh between my thumb and forefinger, it hurt, but it wasn't too bad, you know. Plus the damn Rick coin went crazy. 100 pounds just for that. A day later, and aside from some swelling and general soreness, all you could see was a tiny little prick on either side of the skin. Little cuts across the surface of my skin helped too. I could definitely tell that this thing had preference for blood and anything sharp. And by the end of the first week, not only had I cashed in enough money to send my kid on that skiing trip, but I'd banked an extra £1,200 on top. That wasn't enough to pay off my overdraft and get myself back to square one. I knew it'd take a few months before I had any chance of getting my credit score up. But who cared? So long as I paced myself, I had a practically limitless source of cash. I even tried posting on a few online boards to see if anyone knew about Ritcoin, but nobody did. I was hoping that maybe someone out there knew about the specific rules. Figured that if anyone could game the system, it'd be some smart bugger on the internet. But no one knew what I was on about, and one or two people DM me, offering me links and different resources to help with self-harm and mental illness. The only time someone offered any real help was when some guy told me to look up Derek Little. Apparently, this guy was some anti-capitalist anarchist or, well, you know, some political position with a lot of dashes. The gist of it, though, was that he was a proponent of using decentralized currency to upset mainstream government. He saw himself as some kind of revolutionary. There were only one or two lines about him on various websites, usually citing him as a kind of offhand source. All in all, there was very little about his life. Most of what I saw was actually focused on his death. Nobody knew exactly what had happened, but there was a weird popular copypasta about a cop who found Derek dead in his apartment after receiving complaints about the smell. It was posted all over various chans along with the same few grainy pictures. The images were... Well, they were shock porn, I think. You know, like those websites you share with other kids when you were 14 for a laugh. Waffles of a certain colour, citrus-based parties, etc, etc. I mean, I have to assume that's what they were because... Well, if you saw it, you'd understand. Apparently, this cop walked in on this half-rotten corpse, only to realise that the victim had been going at their whole body with a potato peeler, leaving bits of themselves floating around in the water like some kind of punch bowl. Original description said Derek had weighed 300 pounds before his death, but when the coroner had weighed him, he had cut about 190 pounds away, slither by wafer-thin slither, all of which had to be bagged up and put aside. Anyway, the final twist of the story was that the corpse later went missing. It all sounded like BS to me. Even if I did know next to nothing about cryptocurrency, I still couldn't figure out how the hell it connected to Ritcoin. Sure, even at the time, I found looking at the slimy red-faced figure huddled in the bathtub, cradling their own legs like a fetus, gave me an uncomfortable pang in my chest. But I didn't want to think about it. Not really. Even as the various wounds on my hands and arms started to throb in sympathy at the raw, glistening sight of his exposed flesh. I ignored the anxiety and exited the window, 
and told myself that whatever else happened, I was still in control of my actions and I could easily get the better of whatever hell this thing was. So I kept at it for another week or so, even when some of my cuts started to get infected. I noticed that, at the very least, the Ritcoin account started making me a few pounds for each hour I was unwell. I guess the problem was, I started to run out of room. Or rather, I got a little unimaginative and started letting some of the scars bunch up. By the time I realized it, I was too late. Infection had already set in and my inner palm looked like the pitted flesh of a pomegranate. God damn, it hurt like hell too. Every inch of my skin felt too tight or too cold. It was like my flesh was poisoned, like I could feel something rancid living in the blood that moved around with every heartbeat. On top of that, I started shaking all the time and ended up with one hell of a fever. I still don't know if Ritcoin paid out for being diseased or in pain, but to me, all that mattered was that it paid. You see, I'd gotten a figure in my head. It wasn't going to revolutionize anything, but if I got enough cash, I could move out of my flat and live closer to my kid. I stopped withdrawing money out of Ritcoin and let it build up instead, which was just as well really, since by the end, my fingers were so swollen I could barely even type. But I guessed I could just figure that out when it came to it. Even the pain had started to wane a little. I think it was because I started to associate it with the payout, maybe. I can't say. Looking back, I did some messed up stuff to myself. The worst was when I noticed my hand was so thick and fat, it looked... Well, it looked poppable, for want of a better word. So, I took this sewing needle, laid it out vertically in my palm so it was pointed between my two middle fingers. Gently, I cupped it enough so that each end started to dig into flesh at the base and top of my palm. I stayed there for a while, just gently squeezing and relaxing my hand, needling away at the flesh until blood as thick as honey trickled down my wrist. And then, I clenched, almost mesmerized by the way the needle, buttressed by the bones at the base of my wrist, was thrust through the flesh between my two knuckles. It felt like a hot lance was jammed into my hand, the pain roaring upwards through my arm and even into my chest. But I laughed. Good grip, the screen flashed. Now we're seeing what you're made of. Remaining funds, £6,703.25. After that, I collapsed, only to later awaken in an almost fever-drunk state, just so I could pull the needle out, wincing as the smooth metal slid out of my flesh in one long, slow motion. I remember thinking that I'd let the stress get the better of me. Maybe the endless payments, the fact I couldn't go to work, which meant I had to make up for the lost income in other ways, and the endless cycle of infection and cutting. I wound up bedbound, watching the Ritcoin trickling upwards while I dipped in and out of strange dreams. Over time, the days started to blur until I felt like it was one horrible nightmare, one where that red-faced man from the picture was sitting at the foot of my bed, dripping effluent onto my carpet. In my dream, all I could care about was that he was making a mess and I tried desperately to get up, but if I moved, he just put a hand on my ankle and it had paralyzed me with fear. God, I can still see it now. That slick, slippery cold hand that felt like someone had put a raw chicken breast on my ankle, but the mere presence of it stopped me from being able to blink. He had total power over me and it terrified me and I couldn't stop my eyes tracing the messed up patterns carved into his arms and his chest. The way he looked at me, it was like he was disappointed. He looked so sad, so angry, like a parent who couldn't quite get to grips with a the kid they'd birthed. I don't know why, but I got it into my feverish head that he was going to beat me that he was going to tear me open and start pulling away and guzzling down my blood and tearing his ivory teeth into my flesh, all so that he could see what I'm made of, I cried, startling myself awake. My bedsheets were soaked. 
not just in sweat, but blood and pus. The smell coming off me was sweet and rancid, like rotting apples in a dumpster. Before I even knew it, I was retching and flung myself halfway out of my bed so I could vomit in the nearby wastebasket. Jesus, I felt like a ton of bricks had landed on me, but at least my temperature felt normal and my head was clear. Looking at my arms and hands, I saw the skin was scarred and wounded, but where once it had been pallid, almost bluish as it shimmered under a constant patina of sweat and infection. It was now a healthy pink. Scars were starting to flake away. The itch had gone. After that, I stuck my head under the nearest tap and drank until I felt like I was going to be sick. That was one of the best feelings of my entire life. Just the cooling water running down my throat and my chin, washing away the feeling of filth and crust. I needed it so damn bad. Stumbling back into my room afterwards, I felt like I'd been given a reprieve, and it was with great anxiety and uncertainty that I pulled away the bedsheets and threw them into the nearby bin. I had to ignore the strange striated pattern of rust brown marks close to the foot of the bed. It looked an awful lot like the fingers of a hand had been laid over the quilt, and the mere sight of it made me feel ill again, like the fever was returning. When I finally brought myself to the laptop, I saw the final balance. Now your sins are writ upon your flesh, we finally know what you are made of. Remaining funds, 9,756 pounds, 34 pence. I entered my account balance and withdrew it all. Before I finally quit, the screen updated once more. All done. Your final score? 14,813 pounds, 42 pence. High score? 2,014,392 pounds, 42 pence. Not even close. Try again. Let your sins be writ upon your... I close the lid and then bin the stick not even throwing it out into the wild. Instead, I formatted it, then chucked it right into the garbage. And, although I had a burning suspicion the formatting wouldn't do much, I at least hoped it might end up at the bottom of a garbage dump somewhere, buried beneath tons of trash and metal. At least, that's what I hoped. Lately, I can't help but notice passing stories of the mentally ill and deranged. No one else could possibly recognise the signs like I do. I guess my fever gave me a lucky break. It stopped me doing it long enough that I got a clear head. Sometimes I still wonder about that high score. About how the hell anyone could have managed it and lived to tell the tale. But then again, none of the others I see online live very long. Like I said, anyone else just writes it off as someone going loony. But I can tell the difference. That thing, it must travel somehow. Last case I heard was a guy in Germany who stuck his fingers into a mechanical pencil sharpener. But the one that really broke me was the bloke who worked at the tip a few dozen miles away. I think it's because I knew he must have been the next in the chain right after me. I feel more responsible for him than anyone else. Deep down, I know I should have kept the stick. But the temptation was just too much. The last thing the guy said to anyone before peeling away chunks of his belly fat with a piece of rusted metal was. Let's see what I'm made of. I am truly running out of options. My employers refuse to take my reports and have even threatened termination of my contract if I bring these events back to the table again. The local authorities are dismissive, or even worse, accuse me of substance abuse and mental instability. I can't even tell my own family, lest they draw the same conclusions. I wouldn't want to drag them into this anyway. Hopefully some of you people can help me. At least help me understand what is going on. I have worked as a forester in Appalachia for a logging company that will go unnamed for nearly a decade now. In that time, I have come to love my job, the woods, and the freedom that accompanies both. But things have started to change with my most recent assignment. 
God, the woods used to feel so safe, so clean. Now, I can't stop my hands from shaking when I stand beneath the green canopy. So, now that we're all on the same page, I'll walk you through the fieldwork of my profession. First, the company assigns me a tract of land they have recently acquired. I do some less exciting prep work in the office, satellite imaging, GIS, property analysis, etc. And then I head out into the field. Generally, the sites are pretty far from the offices, requiring multiple hour drives and overnight camping. I bring along some simple camping gear, tape measures, manual clinometer and altimeter, bright neon orange marking spray paint, and my GPS transmitter and marker. All in all, a bunch of technical nonsense that lets me determine the value of trees, which should be logged and which should be left behind to ensure no permanent damage is done to the forest. Simple enough. It was early morning on September 21st, 2019, when my office desktop pinged that I had an incoming email. Seeing that it was an assignment from corporate, I opened it up and nearly let out a cheer in my cubicle. The tract I had been assigned was a huge patch of old growth forest located near the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. For those of you who don't know, an old forest growth is a wooded area that has not been disturbed for hundreds of years, allowed to grow and develop in its natural state without intervention by farming, construction or logging. Many old growths haven't been touched since the settlers arrived, and some even before then. In any case, this was a cause for celebration. Old growth is increasingly rare and amazingly beautiful, and I was the one assigned to explore it. Of course, this was bittersweet, seeing as I would be the last to see it undespoiled before I gave the loggers the go-ahead. I spent the morning in the office packing my things and loading them into the tiny white Ford Ranger, lovingly nicknamed Piper, that the company had provided to me when I started working for them. She was a rugged little thing, having carried me through the mountains for almost a decade without protest. Of course, she wasn't without her quirks. Crank-operated windows, a rattling tailgate, and an AC that hadn't functioned since 2011. But I love that tiny little truck. Piper and I set out around noon, making good time on the four-hour drive through the rugged depths of West Virginia. We arrived at the old trailhead that would deliver me to my tract late into the afternoon. As I strapped my heavy backpack on and locked Piper up for her stay on the edge of the woods, I breathed deeply, taking in the heavy scent of forest earth and the sound of wind and birdsong through the treetops. Giving my truck a pass on the hood, I turned and made my way off the country road and onto the narrow dirt track that wound into the woods. The hike to the old growth stand of trees took about an hour of brisk trekking, the path becoming more and more overgrown as I progressed. It was obvious this trail hadn't been consistently used for years, probably decades. Nearly to my destination, I happened across what should have been the first sign that something was not right. An ancient sycamore tree stood in the dead center of the path. Had it been any other species, I would have sidestepped it and kept plugging ahead. But sycamores had always been my favorite trees, so I craned my neck upwards to admire the old beauty. About 12 feet off the ground, twisted and woven through a tangle of white barked branches, was the decomposing skeleton of a deer. Scraps of rotting fur and mummified tendons, the only things holding the carcass together as it dangled from the tree. I gasped and stepped back from the initial shock. The staring, skeletal visage of an old deer being the last thing I had expected to see. My first thought was that a mountain lion or similar predator had hauled the animal up there to feast upon. Carnivores like that were pretty rare in the area, but I had guessed it wasn't entirely out of the question. But my confusion spiked, and the rumblings of dread gestated in my gut when I looked just a little bit closer. It was difficult to tell due to the distance from the forest floor and amount of time the deer had been up there, but as I squinted, and stared, I noticed something haunting. The decrepit animal remains were not simply jumbled into the tree branches. They were lashed into place by scraps of rope and cloth. Someone had hauled that deer 12 feet of the sycamore tree 
and tied its limbs and joints so it would stay suspended up there. Directly beneath the nearly completely rotted animal, barely visible due to age, was carved a simple O, presumably slashed into the bark by whoever took the time to create this macabre installation. I was understandably shocked and confused by this discovery, but the apparent age of the carving and carcass eased my worries a little. Whoever had done this had obviously done their work months ago. I resolved that until I happened across fresher work, I was unlikely to run into anyone else out here in the woods. Having reassured myself for the moment and excited to lay my eyes on rare old growth, I carried on down the trail towards my destination. I reached the edge of my assigned stand around 6.30 that night, the old ill-maintained trail terminating in a small clearing on the border of the forest I'd hiked through and the secluded acres of the old growth that waited beyond. I gazed, awestruck, at what waited for me. Ancient gnarled tree trunks that soared stories high, capped with dense foliage that cast the groves in a placid twilight. One of the defining features of old growth is a lack of an understory. Smaller plants choked by sunlight by the canopy above. This means that you can see much further than you could in a different forest, where brush and vines might block your view. In the old growth ahead of me, I could see deep into the canopy shaded woods. Darkness enveloping trees that grew in twisted and gnarled shapes. Ancient beings shaped by countless years into warped and beautiful lines. I was nearly overtaken by the sight. A few that so few people are able to look upon in this modern age. Even though I was nearly shaking with excitement to explore the acres large stand of forest ahead of me, I knew that daylight would not last much longer. I would have to push off starting my work until the next day working quickly to pitch my tent and create a small stone ring to act as my fire pit before nightfall overtook my new campsite. That first night on the edge of the old growth was quiet. As I lay tightly wrapped in my sleeping bag, staring up through the vent net in the roof of my tent towards the stars above, I heard almost none of the sounds one might expect from camping deep in the woods. No night birds called, no insects buzzed, the only sounds were the rushing of wind through the leaves, and once, the mournful sound of an owl hooting somewhere within the ancient grove beyond my camp. I sat there awake, in the eerie silence, nearly the entire night, partially perturbed by the quiet, but mostly entranced by the beauty of the starlit sky and filled with excitement for the day to come. I eventually drifted off to sleep around 2am. At 5.30 in the morning, I was awoken by the electronic chirping of my watch alarm, signalling the start of my day. Groggily sitting up, I immediately regretted not forcing myself to sleep earlier. Yanking the zipper of my tent flap and exposing myself to the chill morning air, I rose to a stoop and began to exit my tent. As my head left the tent, I stopped, dead, frozen and staring. I was staring down the barrel of a pump-action shotgun, clutched in the hands of a middle-aged bearded man. He wore old flannel and denim, a stained old baseball cap over a mop of greying hair. His face was cracked and split by intricate wrinkles, the telltale aging enjoyed by a man who had spent his life outdoors. His grey eyes squinted as he met my shocked gaze, lowering the gun. Well, damn. I'm sorry, son. Didn't expect anybody. What the hell do you mean you didn't expect anybody? I asked, anger boiling to the surface as the shock of surprise ebbed away. You walked into a campsite at five in the morning. Why wouldn't there be anybody here? His dark face didn't change from his stony demeanor. Look, boy, I said I was sorry. No harm, no foul, right? He shrugged nonchalantly, irritatingly dismissive of the fact that he had a loaded gun pointed between my eyes mere moments ago. He slung the weapon over his shoulder and extended a hand to help me out of my tent. Most tents you find up here are empty. It took a moment for what he had said to sink in. What do you mean? Like people come up here to dump their trashed old equipment? 
disappointment began to brew as the thought of the old growth filled with trash entered my mind. Nah, son, nothing like that. Just exactly what I said. The tents you find up here are always empty. The name's Randy. Randy Davidson. This plot belonged to my grandpa and his grandpa before him. His West Virginia drawl was thick and slow as he gestured towards the old growth stand. Before Grandpa sold it to the National Forest folks, eminent domain and whatnot. I furrowed my brow. Not only had I had the shock of my life less than a minute ago, now I was listening to the family history of some Appalachian backwater hick. My patience grew thin. So is that why you go poking around in other people's business? Scaring them half to death when they wake up? For old time's sake? Randy squinted again, unimpressed with my impatience. Look, boy, all I'm gonna say is you better watch yourself out in these woods. Grandpa used to tell stories, was happy to have the feds take the land off his hands. Just pack up and leave, is my advice. And with that, he turned and started walking away in the direction he came from. I stood there in uneasy silence and just watched him go. What the hell? Was that a warning or a threat? And what could he have possibly meant about empty tents? His message had surprised and confused me as much as this sudden appearance in my camp. The early morning light grew brighter and the mist that clung to the ground burned away as I gathered my things and prepared for my first foray into the old growth stand. I nearly inhaled my breakfast, excited to start my work. Then, pack filled and secure, I stepped beyond the edge of the grove. The old growth was breathtaking. Ancient gnarled trees surrounded me as I walked, dark twisting shapes disappearing into the shadowy canopy high above. No underbrush cluttered the ground, just stoic old boulders and thick sheets of soggy moss. The dense cover of leaves above cast the entire huge stand in the eerie pall of cool shade. The heavy scent of loamy earth and wet wood filled my nose and lungs. Pristine silence filled the forest. I set to work immediately, invigorated by my utterly gorgeous surroundings. The noise I made was the only sound to echo through the ancient woods around me, joining the quiet wind in the leaves above. I identified species, measured trunk diameters, calculated height and slope, judged quality timber from the trees best left standing. God damn, I thought to myself, almost all of these trees were worth thousands of dollars in timber as individuals. This stand of old growth alone would likely net the company over a million dollars after harvest. How in hell had this place not been logged yet? With a metallic rattle and aerosol hiss, I marked the trees that would be harvested with my flagging paint. With the forest floor so clear of undergrowth, the bright orange X's I sprayed on the tree trunk could be seen in the distance in every direction, looming out of the darkness in their obvious unnatural neon hue. It felt strange to be painting this place, so long left beyond the reach of humanity. It was after 4pm and I was finishing up the last sections of the stand I had decided to work on today. It was a small, low valley near the center of the old growth, edged by mossy boulders and muddy slopes. I would nearly finished marking the chosen trees in the valley when I came across something hauntingly strange. As I rounded the massive trunk of a beautiful old red oak, I saw it. Sitting in the middle of a tiny clearing Shaded by the dark leaves above was the rusted hulk of an old RV. The paint was chipped and peeled away, almost to the point of non-existence, though there was still enough left to make out the classic script of Winnebago. The tires were flat, flaccid sacks of rubber draped over rusted hubcaps. Moss grew over the windows of the abandoned vehicle, at least where the glass hadn't shattered and dropped away. The side door hung limply open on failing hinges, revealing nothing but inky darkness inside. I slowly approached the derelict vehicle, wet moss and leaves squelching under my boots. How did this thing get down here? There was no way it could have driven down the steep slopes of the valley, and there weren't any signs that it had fallen or crashed down here. Besides the ravages of time, the old RV seemed undamaged. I stepped within a few feet of the Winnebago's open door. 
I fumbled through my backpack and produced my flashlight, noticing that the vehicle was ringed by a thick layer of heavy grey mud. Spurred by curiosity, I clicked my flashlight on and stepped on board the ruined RV through the broken door. As I did so, the entire vehicle let out a wretched moan as rusted springs shifted for the first time in what had likely been decades. I threw a glance back over my shoulder into the forest, suddenly feeling watched. All I noticed through the forest gloom were the neon orange X's I had painted on the trees, pointed at haphazard angles and partially hidden by gnarled trunks. The interior of the RV was dark as night, even with the gloomy daylight flickering through some of the small sections of broken windows. The stark white beams of my flashlight cut through the blackness, a circle of vision too small for comfort. Something felt off the moment I was inside. The cabin of the vehicle was almost empty. Driver and passenger seats devoured down to the metal frames by generations of vermin. Crusty lichen encased the steering column. The cup holders held two old metal thermoses. The words number one dad and number one mom just barely visible through the years of sylvan filth that had accumulated upon them. I turned my face to the main living space of the old wreck, silence thick on the air and only cut through by the agonized creaks of the moldering floor beneath me. The built-in couch here had suffered the same fate as the cabin seats, devoured by rats and insects searching for a nest. Cupboards hung open near the low ceiling, cardboard boxes of food within reduced to pulp and slurry by years of exposure. I shone my needle of light across the room noticing the narrow door at the rear. It hung barely ajar, a crack of darkness presumably leading to the RV's bedroom. As I stepped closer, the stench of mildew and wet dirt grew almost overpowering. With the groan of rusty hinges, I pushed the door open. My blood ran cold as my flashlight beam settled on what waited beyond the doorway. Shocked, my breaths came in quick and shallow as I took in the sight the room held a bed, mattress and blankets, untouched by foraging pests, but stained a deep black brown by mold and God knows what else. Upon the bed was a heap of clothing, gathered from the suitcases, haphazardly left a rot on the floor around the bed. The clothes were stained the same foul shade as the mattress. I could make out at least four distinct sizes of clothing in the pile, two adults and two children. The stink of rotting vegetation was unimaginable. My hands shook, bobbing my light as they did so, as I gazed at the top of the pile. Atop the wet heap of moldy old clothing was the dripping carcass of a deer, limbs broken and twisted at unnatural angles to allow the decaying thing to be propped in a pose like a man sitting cross-legged. Its head was bowed towards me, what was left of the meat blackened by rot and slowing off its skull beneath lichen-coated antlers. Its eyes had long since liquefied, dripping down its cheeks in curdled rivulets and leaving empty black sockets to stare into the dark. The cluster of mossy and scattered head bones with the headboard revealed that this was merely the most recent animal left here, the next in a long line of slaughtered deer propped up in this macabre. Despite the dribbling animal wreckage before me, there was no smell of rotting meat, just the singularly wretched and overpowering odour of composing vegetation and decomposing fungus. Acrid vomit filled my mouth and sinuses and I bolted for the door behind me. As I stuck my head and shoulders outside and prepared to retch, my eyes laid upon a fresh horror. The bright orange of my marking paint sprayed at haphazard and dissonant angles as I had wandered the valley, all faced towards me in uniform stairs. Every X I had painted down here looked towards me, neon colour cutting through the forest gloom like electric eyes. The remainder of the food left in my stomach, replaced by ice water as I lurched forward and vomited messily upon the mossy ground. Leaning from inside the RV, body shaking with confusion and terror, I hung my head and wiped the bitter puke from my mouth and tears from my eyes. The smell of rotting wood still clogged my nostrils. I stared at the splatter of fresh vomit below me, attempting to comprehend what I was looking at. 
the steaming bile was collecting in a footprint in the sticky grey mud. My shaky breath rattled in my lungs as I stared. It was unmistakable. Fresh tracks marred the mud that surrounded the derelict RV, a complete circle that stalked around the vehicle. They were deep, pressed into the muck by something big and heavy. The tracks took the shape of half a human foot, the long toes and forefoot evident of the tracks of someone walking barefoot and tiptoeing. Jesus Christ, even the partial footprints were bigger than the tracks I had left. How had something so large moved so quietly around the RV? I hadn't heard a thing from inside. I rose to trembling feet and took a cautious step outside. The old growth was utterly silent beyond my nervous painting. The bright orange X's still stared in my direction. Not a one where I'd originally placed it. Damn it, damn it, damn it, I thought to myself. I stood, scanning the empty forest floor and listening for any sounds that pierced the quiet. Seconds passed, feeling like an eternity. And then, I bolted. Blood pounded in my ears as I sprinted through the forest, never once slowing as I made for camp. The feeling of a cold, calculating gaze from unseen eyes never left my back as I ran. I skidded into my tiny camp on the edge of the stand as the sun began to dip in the darkening sky, nearly collapsing with exhaustion as the daylight that filtered through the trees above began to die. As I panted and gasped with exertion, I surveyed my surroundings. My tent and firing appeared untouched since I left this morning. As dusk settled over the forest, my surroundings began to darken. It wouldn't be long until they were as black as the old growth of my back. There was no way I could leave tonight. Even if I wasn't petrified to be out in the dark, there wasn't a chance in hell I could find my way back to Piper through the black and unfamiliar woods. My mind raced as daylight failed around me. Do I set a fire and hope light and flames keeps whatever was out there at bay? Or do I sit in darkness and pray that I stay hidden in a shadowy and silent camp? There were no good options. My bowels knotted inside me as I fought to keep panic from setting in. Eventually, the primal instincts of my cave-dwelling ancestors kicked in. Fire was the one tool that had always served our kind against the darkness and the things that lurked within it. I piled all of my firewood into the ring. I wouldn't need it for another night. And as night fell, the glowing light of my bonfire lit the forest around me, faltering at the edges of the old growth. My camp bathed in firelight. I climbed inside my tent and sealed the zipper shut. I sat silently inside the thin neon shell for hours, listening as the wind made the only sound beyond the crackling of my fire which glowed through the walls of the tent. My hands shook as my spine prickled with nerves, my teeth chattering despite the humid heat that clung to my body, sweat dripping from my brow. I moved slowly to check my watch. 3.30am. Less than two hours until the first break of daylight. Less than two hours until I could flee this place. I jolted as a sudden snap shattered the silence. The sharp cracking noise emanated not 20 feet from my tent and followed by staccato rustling before deathly silence. My eyes were wide, breath caught in my throat. The quiet, nearly imperceptible rustling came again. Whatever was outside was still there. I slowly grasped the zipper pull with my left hand while fumbling about with my right until it came to rest upon my pocket knife. It was a feeble little thing, barely helpful as a tool for whittling, but as a gift from my dad, it always found its way into my pack. With my impotent little blade clutched tight, I opened the door of my tent, agonizingly slowly to keep the zipper quiet. I crept out into the night, the chill air shockingly cold as it connected with my overheated and clammy skin. The bonfire still burned, though it had run low as the night dragged on. Silently surveying the camp before me, I searched for the source of the hushed sound. Slowly, my gaze was drawn upwards into the boughs of the trees. Two 
eyes reflected in the firelight, staring back at me. Shock gripped my heart, and it took all of my willpower not to exclaim with fear and surprise. The eyes cocked to the side, as if judging me. With more quiet rustles, the owl shifted on its branch, close enough that the firelight revealed its identity. Relief flooded my body, and I let out a quiet sigh. Then, true terror overtook me as I noticed the huge shape in my peripheral vision. I slowly turned my head, tears welling up in my eyes. It sat, waiting on its haunches, barely six feet away from me, dimly lit by the embers of the slowly dying fire. At first, I thought it was a huge man, a giant living in the woods, but this thing was no human. It never could have been. It sat, nearly curled in a fetal ball, long arms clasped to its scrawny legs and shoulders hunched. Completely naked, its humanoid form was covered in greasy, pale skin stretched taut over knobby bones and joints. Black grey veins pulsed beneath its thin flesh. The thing's elongated arms and legs were triple jointed, digitigrade, like the hind legs of a repulsively malnourished and hairless goat. Its arms ended in hands, each bearing six long and twitching fingers tipped with ragged and blackened nails. Its legs terminated in feet that may have been human, if they were not twisted and deformed to allow the thing to walk on its mud and filth caked toes. It carried an unbearable stench of fungus and compost, but most horrible of all was its face. Atop its spindly neck rested the thing's gaunt head, oily and pale skin reflecting the guttering flames in the fire pit. Its nose and chin were hideously long and crooked, not unlike the jagged and pointed features stereotypical of ancient witches. Its mouth was wide and lipless, flesh pulled back to reveal black gums and long, blunted teeth that looked as if they had been taken from a human jaw and stretched cartoonishly to fit this horror skull. Though it had no eyes, it stared intently at the owl in the tree. No, not eyeless. The twisted and hulking creature crouched beside me, slowly turned its head to face me. Barely visible, white orbs rolled and twitched in sunken eye sockets, bulging beneath a pallid and thin membrane of flesh. The horror stared silently at me, before raising a single finger to its lipless and drooling teeth. It let out a quiet, gurgling breath. Shh. Panic set my body ablaze. I scrambled to my feet, dropping my tiny pocket knife into the mud. The owl let out a shrieking protest as it took flight, spooked by my sudden movement. As I stumbled backwards, starting my sprint into the pitch black forest, the thing rose to its feet on tri jointed legs. Good God, the thing had to have been at least seven feet tall but its body moved without making a sound. As I turned and ran, it let out a hideous, gasping screech, a sound laden with ancient hate. I didn't look back, dashing through the underbrush, away from the old growth, and leaving an empty tent to join the others Randy had found. I don't know if it followed me. It was so big, but it moved so silently. As I ran, I didn't see it, didn't hear it, but the feeling of its gaze never left me. I ran, blindly in the dark, whipping branches and bramble thorns slashing my face and hands, seemingly to ribbons. Blood and sweat drenched me, pooling in my hiking boots. I don't know how long I ran. At some point, I must have collapsed with exhaustion, blacking out in the depths of the forest. I woke up in the glaring shine of daylight, filtering down onto my face through the trees. My face and hands were caked with blood and dirt. At least two of my fingers were broken, or at least dislocated. Rising on shaking legs, I began my blind trek into the unfamiliar woods around me, hopelessly lost. I walked for hours, likely wandering in circles. My face and hands ached with dull, pulsing pain. The skin of my chest itched and burned beneath my shirt. Finally, I stumbled into the forest trail, old and ill-maintained. 
I couldn't believe my luck. I'd resigned myself to being lost, dying alone and hunted deep in unsettling Appalachia. Tears welled up as I hurriedly limped down the path and I nearly shouted with elation when Piper came into view. Fumbling with my keys, I managed to unlock her and climb inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. As I fired the ignition and the truck started up, the burning of my chest intensified, an awful itching sensation. Grimacing, I quickly set about undoing the button on my shirt to see what the cause of my discomfort was. As I did so, a subtle stench of old vegetation began wafting into my truck. I felt gold eyes staring from the fingers of the woods. I pulled my shirt open, exposing my chest and the source of the itch. Across the flesh of my chest, sprayed there with marker paint, was a bright orange X. Apparently, it appears most often by the front door, but can also be near bedroom windows. My next door neighbour, Margaret, used to have this problem. It's a shame Margaret was a mother. That was my first thought upon meeting her, and one I had often since. She definitely didn't deserve her son, Devin. They moved into my neighbourhood four years ago. Right away, I found Devin to be the most thoughtful and polite three-year-old that I had ever known. Unfortunately, I also got to know Margaret as well. She often would come over and slam a meaty fist on my door just to complain about small issues. Stuff like when a dog got loose from my backyard or that my grass was getting overgrown. She explained it all as being for Devin's benefit and, at first, I was understanding. After all, no one wants a strange dog coming near their kid. But my dogs loved kids and none were breeds known for their aggressiveness. I didn't try to let them loose, but it happened every now and then, with none of the other neighbours minding. The grass issue was harder to understand. My grass wasn't very long, but Margaret was worried about Devin running through my yard, and she didn't want him to trip over anything he couldn't see. I tried to mow my lawn regularly, and Devin wasn't even allowed out of house regularly, but she'd still cry out at me to do a better job picking up sticks and whatnot for my grass. It didn't take long to realise, she just got under Devin for everything. If he talked back to her, she'd yell at him for being rebellious. If he was silent, she'd screech at him for not having anything to say. I've also witnessed her, many times, grab him by the arm and twist hard enough to make me worry about him breaking something. She's always been rough with Devin, but I only ever found the courage to protest once. After I called her out, over my fence a safe distance away, she came by later with homemade cookies to try and explain. Honestly, this visit was the only reason I never ended up calling the cops. Not because of the cookies, they tasted like bitter soap. But she had a heartbreaking story to tell, one that made me feel sorry for the old woman. They had to move here from the coast after her husband, Devin's father, drowned to death in a tragic accident. Margaret and Devin's father were packing up from a visit to the beach when they realised that Devin wasn't with them. They searched all around for him as soon as they noticed he was gone. The father thought he saw a boy that looked like Devin on the pier and rushed there while Margaret stayed near the car. Eventually, Devin jumped out of a hiding place behind the changing stations and yelled, Boo! to Margaret. It turned out that he had decided on an impromptu game of hide and seek and had stayed hidden, even when he saw and heard his father looking for him. Margaret raced to the pier, but was slowed down by having to drag around a now screaming and crying Devin. He just didn't understand what was going on. Sadly, they both witnessed the dad jumping into the water from the end of the pier. Margaret thought that he must have searched the whole pier and gotten worried that Devin had fallen into the water himself. Either way, Margaret and Devin would end up going home alone that day. They waited around for bad news to arrive, but when it did, she immediately made plans to move far inland. 
so that's how she became my neighbour. But this story also explained why she was equally paranoid about Devon's safety and angry at his existence. She didn't admit that, of course, but it was obvious with how she used phrases like, You must understand, Devon never meant any harm, it was just an accident how he killed his father. As harsh as it always was, I couldn't even begin to imagine the hurt both of them were living with. So, I didn't try. I figured Margaret was doing the best she could under the circumstances, so I never called her out a second time. And it didn't hurt that I'd do anything to avoid another awkward meeting. Margaret was a large woman with no real concept of personal space. After our little talk, she found excuses to be outside when I came home from work. Eventually, she gave up and became quite reclusive. Everyone in the neighbourhood breathed a sigh of relief and we largely just continued on with our lives. Until recently, when I saw Margaret outside again as I pulled into my driveway. She was dragging Devon by the ear to a waiting trash can by the curb. She tossed in a book with her other hand and was shrieking at Devin when I got out of the car. She paused, and at first, I thought it was for my benefit. Instead, she pointed at her own front door and screamed, Devin, is that sand? I followed a finger and saw a small pile of sand next to their open door. I assumed she was just angry at how Devin had tracked around a mess. If I had stopped to think for a second, I would have wondered more about where Devon had managed to step in sand. He was homeschooled and Margaret never let him out of her sight for long. But I didn't think. I just didn't want Devon to be punished anymore. I cleared my throat and said, I'm sorry, I had a work project that involved sand and I spilled some all over the sidewalk. It's windy today, so it probably got everywhere else. Devon must not have been able to avoid it if he walked near my yard. Margaret looked at me suspiciously, but then she asked Devin if that sounded like what happened. She had a surprising amount of hope in her voice. Devin looked confused, but only for a second. He was grateful to take the opportunity I provided and said, Well, I did check the mail earlier. Margaret immediately started yelling again, but now about how careless her son was. She didn't even blame me for not cleaning up my mess. She dragged him back into the house and I wasn't entirely sure if I had actually helped out Devon. There was just no satisfying that woman. Later that night, when I was walking my dogs, I saw Devin sneaking out of his house. He went to the trash can and was pulling out that book when I walked up to him. He flinched but I held up a hand and tried my best to be reassuring. I just wanted to do my best to keep him out of trouble. Devin explained how the book wasn't anything too special. It was about a father and son surviving the apocalypse together, but that was enough to trigger his mother. I wasn't sure how to bring it up, but Devin must have known what I was thinking. He confirmed what Margaret had told me all those years ago. He said something like, Yeah, my mum doesn't like to be reminded of my dad and she doesn't want me thinking about him either. I guess you've heard what happened. I just nodded. Devin continued sadly. I don't even remember my dad, but I know I wouldn't have wanted to hurt him. Please believe me, if I knew what would happen, I wouldn't have stayed hidden. I did believe him, but it was a very awkward subject, so I tried to change the conversation by bringing up the sand. I just asked him where he thought it really came from. He immediately looked alarmed as he asked, What do you mean? That wasn't because of you? I hoped you were telling the truth. Annoyed he wasn't being more grateful, I said, My bad, I guess I won't try to keep you out of trouble next time. Devin waved his hand frantically as explained, No, 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 you don't understand. Sand at the door or windows is a warning. I really didn't understand and told him so. Devin sighed before explaining. There's this monster that is after me. It's called the Merkander and it will drag me to the ocean one day to drown me. It gets stronger and stronger every time it tries but I'll have to let him eventually. 
All I could do in that moment was stare at Devin, completely speechless at his explanation. Misunderstanding my silence, he continued. You see, the Merkander mistook my dad for me. His soul is probably trapped at the bottom of the ocean. I'll have to be sacrificed to release him to heaven. At least, my mom thinks that's the only way. But not anytime soon. She says it's selfish, but she wants me all to herself for a while. Stammering, I finally figured out how to say, What on earth has that woman been telling you? There's no such thing as monsters. Your daddy is already in heaven, and you definitely do not have to be hurt to save anyone. We had to move here because we found sand by my bedroom window, and I know monsters are real because I live with one. I couldn't argue with that logic, but Devin's words reminded me that I was talking to a seven-year-old child. Wanting him to calm down, I told them that I really did spill the sand over my sidewalk. I had just been kidding earlier, and that he better sneak back into his house before his mom noticed his absence. Of course, I really hoped that he just misunderstood his mother and was making things up. Margaret always seemed miserable and mean to me, but not crazy. After we parted ways, it was several days before I saw either Devin or Margaret. When I did, I was shocked at what I witnessed. I was mowing the lawn, but stopped as soon as their front door burst open. Margaret stormed out, carrying a box full of stuff. She was bleeding from several small cuts on her arms. She either didn't hear me, or didn't care when I asked if she was alright. She dumped the box into the back seat of a car, and stormed right back into her house with a now empty box. She repeated this several times before coming out with Devin, who held two trash bags full of clothes himself. He looked terrible, with several of his own cuts, including a real nasty one over his right eye. I also tried asking him if he was alright, but Margaret gave me an evil look. She finally acknowledged my existence by yelling, Liar! Don't you ever talk to my son again, you, you deceiver! They dumped everything into the car and then raced back into the house. I immediately went to my own kitchen, where I kept a number to the local police department under a magnet on my fridge. I started to call them when I saw Devin through my kitchen window. He was sneaking out again. I quickly opened the window and told him to come to my front door. I let him in and had him go straight to my study, where there were no windows. This wasn't the middle of the night. Margaret was bound to notice him missing and soon. Devin started sobbing and apologizing. I got him to calm down and told him I would take care of everything from here on. I showed him my phone screen with the police's number just waiting for me to press call. Instead of being reassured, Devin knocked the phone out of my hand. He cried, We don't have time for that. I need to get out of here. Not knowing what else to do, I awkwardly held open my arms for a hug and tried to say, It's okay. Your mom can't get in here. But Devin pushed me away and moved to put his back into the nearest corner. He was quieter, but his voice was no less desperate as he said, My mom isn't the problem. We have to leave before the demon finds me. No, your mom is gaslighting you or something. It's just a trick. There's no such thing as demons. Devin shook his head and pointed to the dried blood over his eye. When he spoke, it was through clenched teeth. My mom didn't do this to me. I saw him, the demon. It attacked me, but my mom cast the spell and made him leave. It won't work for long, though. He sighed before continuing. Mom always told me no one would believe me. I should have listened to her. I'm sorry, but I should never have come here. I didn't want him scared any more than he was. I walked out of the room and told him to please just let me talk to his mother first before he went back. Devin asked in a voice that broke my heart. Could you... Could you tell her that you made me come inside? I wasn't about to incriminate myself for kidnapping, but I lied to Devin and said, Sure. I didn't know what I would have said in the end, but either way, I planned on calling the police as soon as possible. But all my plans were dashed when we entered the living room 
and could see Margaret outside the window. She was running, looking for Devin. Instinctively, he dropped to the ground out of sight. I just froze in place. Margaret looked frightened. Not just because her hair was flowing wild as she rushed about, or her wide open, bloodshot eyes. It was because of the desperation she showed in her face and actions. She clawed at my mailbox as she ran past, to swing herself around as though that extra bit of momentum would mean life or death. I wished I had also dropped to the floor, as she slammed into my front door at full force and then kept hammering away while screaming, I see you! I see you! Where's Devin? I need him now! Adding to the noise was the clambering and scraping of my dogs from the back door. I was happy they were safely outside and would miss what would happen next, but their frightened noises didn't help at the time. Devin was also whimpering below me. I can only imagine how quickly he had reconsidered going back to his mom. I had suddenly became terrified of her too. However, I truly panicked when I realised I never locked the front door after letting Devin in. Margaret was just hitting the door, but she could try the handle at any time. I forced my legs to carry me close enough that I could slide the deadbolt in place. Margaret stopped briefly, assuming I was unlocking the door, but I still put the other locks in place. Devin almost ruined everything by jumping up just then. Margaret saw him and tried the handle immediately. I braced the door and yelled at Devin to grab my phone, still on the floor in my study. Margaret doubled her efforts to enter after realising I wasn't going to let her in. I knew talking to her, or at least getting her to listen, would be impossible. So, my only plan was calling the cops and letting them sort this out. But Devin wasn't moving to get the phone. I tried to reason with him, but he slowly walked to the door, crying the whole time. He tried to explain. No, I have to go out there. Don't you see? This is just like last time, only it's my mom that will die this time. Please let me out. I heard wood splintering behind me and furiously shook my head. I begged and pleaded with him to just get the phone. He just asked me, Please, please open the door. I know you're trying to help, but this is exactly how my dad died. Mom stopped me from going out and the demon got my dad as he was looking for me. I felt my blood run cold before I fully understood what he had said. I replied with something like, I thought you were all alone playing hide and seek when your father passed. Because of the awful noise everywhere around me, I had to strain my ears to hear every word of Devin's whispered response. Hide and seek was my mom's idea. She told me where to hide and then told my dad we were playing. Then she came back and kept me from going out. She told me it wasn't safe, because she had seen the demon. I believed him. I mean, I believed Margaret told him those things. So, I tried to tell Devin that his mother was the only demon here. But, he interrupted me and yelled, while pointing out the window. No, look, the Mercander, it's here! The pounding at the door stopped. I looked out the window and saw a swirling dust devil in my driveway. Margaret was facing it, screaming obscenities. Devin hurried to the door and unlocked it, as I moved fully in front of my living room window to get a better view. I could, and should, have stopped Devin, but I was too busy being shocked at the dust devil taking a more humanoid form. It even began to look like he was wearing clothes. It walked like it was underwater, slowly approaching Margaret, and now, more obviously, made entirely of sand. She spat at it as it raised its arms, but that did not stop its sandy boots from marching closer and closer, until it was just ten feet away. Then, sand poured forth from its palms. At first, only a small stream hit her, but the sand was moving fast. Margaret held out a hand to catch the spray, and it worked to divert the slow sand against the rest of her body, but at the cost of almost completely flaying her hand. I'll never forget the spray of blood and skin over her wild face as she turned and screamed in pain. 
the Merkander, or whatever it was, started to pour out a much thicker stream of sand at Margaret. But at that moment, Devin ran in between the two and shielded his mother. The sand hit him like a truck. His body was lifted off the ground, but he never landed. Instead, his body was kept aloft by the seemingly never-ending streams of wind and sand. It became difficult to see, but every now and then, I would catch glimpses of Devin's stripped body. His clothes had offered no protection, and the sand ended up stripping every other layer of him. I couldn't turn away, not even when I saw a perfectly clean skull floating in that mini sandstorm. And then, even that was ground to dust. Mind you, this only took seconds, a minute at most. I might have been screaming the entire time. I only remember hearing that horrible wind, but my throat sure was sore afterwards. Either way, Margaret hadn't wasted a time her son bought her. She stumbled into my home and into the kitchen. I barely noticed her, but she didn't need anyone's help. She turned on the stove and put a pan on the hot plate. She grabbed a cleaver and amputated her mangled arm herself. I only realized what she had been doing later. I was watching as the sandstorm abated, but the swirling sand didn't rejoin the Mercanda. Instead, it formed a second, smaller Mercanda. The only other difference was this one's sand was tinged with blood. The two turned into whirlwinds, whose edges touched and briefly joined. It was almost like they were embracing. When they started to head towards me, that's when I turned to run. But I stopped at the sight of Margaret in my kitchen, putting the stump of her arm on my stove to cauterize her wound. Her howls of pain were soon joined by howling wind as my window shattered and I was knocked to the floor. It became hard to breathe as it felt like the wind was being caught from my lungs and flung into the room. Everything was just sand and wind for a while, until I blacked out. When I awoke, there was no sand, no wind. My broken window and the pile of gore that remained of Margaret's severed arm in my kitchen were all that confirmed I hadn't been dreaming. At last, I got to call the cops, but they were just as confused about the situation as I was. I didn't actually see Margaret killed, so a manhunt was initiated, but she was never found. However, in the investigation, they found Devin was reported missing four years prior, at the same time as his father's unfortunate drowning accident. He was reported missing by his real mother. In search of answers, I was happy when the police shared this information with me. It's how I finally learned the name of Devin's father, James. I wonder if Margaret had ever bothered to learn it for herself. When Devin's mom was shown a picture of Margaret, the poor widower confirmed she had never seen the woman before in her life. This put a big puzzle piece in place for me, but I still don't think I'll ever fully understand what happened. It's been six months since the police closed the investigation and nothing more has come out. But I keep having nightmares of sandy boots marching towards me. Maybe James and Devin are still out there, or is it enough that Margaret probably suffered the same fate as Devin, having her flesh, muscle, bones and all ground up into sand? Could she have turned into one of those vengeful, indomitable spirits, hell-bent on revenge? Either way, I'm very worried about the pile of sand I found outside my front door today. They come for the eyes first. They know they can tear us apart, eat any organ they wish, but it's the eyes they go for first. See, they know that the eyes are the soft bits. Everything else will last for longer once we die, but the eyes are on the surface and they dry out. That's why they devour them first, while we're still conscious. We're powerless against them, chained to the damp floor as they run towards us. You can feel their small bodies slither across you, and all you can do is scream when they sink their pointed, 
suctioning mouths into your eye sockets and rip the eyeballs free from your skull. It's horrible. And the worst part was that I had to watch it all first. There were three of us in the little room when I woke up. All of us were stripped except for our underwear, and each of us was strapped down with chains bolted into the floor. All I could do at first was twist my head, which ached like hell from side to side. I didn't see much. It was dark in the room I woke up in, and other than a man on the other side of me, the room was bare of anything else. Pipes connected into the walls and the roof, and I could hear water dripping somewhere distant. I think we were in a sewer. I heard the guy on my right groan out, and I turned to face him. He was older, maybe in his late fifties, with graying hair and a scraggly beard. He turned his head almost immediately towards me, and our eyes locked. I saw the same fear reflected in his green irises that were probably in mine. What? Where are we? He gasped out, uselessly trying to push against the chains. Before I could answer, the man to my left spoke up. It's useless trying to get free, he whispered, and would have been barely audible if his voice hadn't echoed in the empty room. I've tried it already, while you two were still out, but there was no way to get free. Whoever put us here, they want a good show. What the hell do you mean? I shot back, turning to face him. He was younger than the other man, maybe in his early thirties. His skin was a dark caramel and his head was shaved bald. And there was a hard look to him that made me want to take back the bite in my words. Maybe it was the muscles I could see rippling against the chains. Look up to the right. They're watching us. I glanced over to where he indicated, and sure enough, I saw a tiny, blinking red light. My eyes adjusted to the shadows after a few moments, and the outline of a security camera came into focus in the dark. Where are we? The man to my right repeated again, but this time the fight had drained out of his voice. And who are you two? No idea, the man on my left replied. My name's Edwin, though. I work in construction, and I went to sleep in my apartment like normal last night. I woke up here. No idea how. I'm Colton, I added after a few moments' pause. I have an office job downtown, and... I trailed off as I fought to remember the last few moments before everything had blacked out, and the memories eventually came back along with my headache. I think I was jumped walking back to my car. It was late and dark, and I wasn't in a very good part of town. I thought it was a normal mugging, but now... I'm Peter, the man on my right said simply. Worked at Best Buy as a manager for years. I was going to retire next week. There was silence after that. Peter and I... We ignored Edwin's warnings and struggled against our chains, but nothing budged. We shouted for help next, shouted until our voices went hoarse, but even that didn't work. We were left in the silence and the darkness as the camera blinked on, and I was stuck with my thoughts as my only real company. I knew that no matter where we were or who brought us here, this could only end badly. I had worked past the initial shock and panic of when I first woke up, but now a new kind of fear worked its way through me. It was dread of what was coming, whatever that might be, and it was overwhelming. We waited for what felt like forever, Edwin and Peter occasionally trying to strike up small talk, but when you're strapped down in a foreign place with two strangers beside you, you don't tend to feel like talking much. Their chit-chatting died down in an instant though, when something that sounded like some kind of ceremonial gong sounded out behind us. I jumped and whipped my head around. I couldn't turn that far to see, but I caught a glimpse of Edwin trying to do the same. What the hell was that? He shouted. Who the hell's out there, huh? Show yourself. The next sound that came 
wasn't one that we expected. It could only be described like a hundred tiny feet scrambling over cobblestone. And although it started quiet, it grew and grew and grew until it was almost deafening in volume. We thrashed against our bonds futilely in panic, but there was no escaping. Then, out of nowhere, a woman's voice came into the room through some kind of hidden loudspeaker. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready for tonight's main event. The game's about to begin, so please place your final bets. The next sound came from my immediate right, and it was the sound of screaming. I whipped my head around frantically, but what I saw made me want to shut my eyes in revulsion. There were things all over Peter. They looked like a cross between a slug and a spider, maybe four or five inches in length, with half a dozen thin, scaly legs protruding from their black, oozing bodies. They weren't doing anything to him as far as I could see, but there were dozens of them crawling onto him and tracking their way across his bare skin. He writhed underneath his chains, but he couldn't move enough to shake them off. I could only watch as he was slowly covered by the things. That was when they went for his eyes. Two of them scrambled across his neck and he whipped his head from side to side, trying to throw them off. I was yelling. Edwin was screaming words in Spanish I couldn't understand, and Peter was screaming in pure, unadulterated terror. His face was towards me for a moment, and I caught his look of panic. A look of a man who knew he's already dead. As I watched, one of the creature's heads extended a thick, long appendage from what appeared to be its mouth, and it hovered over Peter's face for a moment as the man froze, suddenly not daring to move a muscle. The appendage was like a tongue, long and spongy and round, but serrated into a thousand tiny teeth at the end. In an instant, the creature sunk the appendage into Peter's eye with a sickening squelch, and blood sprayed everywhere. Peter erupted in fresh screams of agony, and the creature dug its tongue deeper as he screamed. Blood splashed out, and I felt warm droplets spray across my face as the tongue pulsed and writhed as it sucked from Peter's screaming face, and three more of the creatures crawled up to join it. I couldn't stop looking, no matter how much my mind willed my body to turn away. More of the creatures sunk their tongues into his eyes as he roared in pain, and no matter how much he thrashed, they didn't fall off. Their legs sunk into his skin like knives, keeping them rooted in place as they drained the soft food from his face. And when that was over, he was still screaming all the way until the first few forced their legs into his mouth and disappeared down his throat. Then his screams were replaced by sickening, throaty gargles as blood dripped from his mouth, and then he made no more sounds. Soon, all of the creatures had followed into his throat and disappeared into his still warm corpse. That was when I was finally able to pull my eyes away in revulsion. Edwin was crying out beside me, repeating the words, Oh God, oh God, oh my God, over and over again. But I don't think God could hear us. I didn't do much of anything. My brain wasn't processing what I just saw. I just lay there as I listened to the soft scraping noises coming from the direction of Peter's body as the things fed from the inside out. I don't know how long had passed until we heard the next clang of the gong. I turned to look at Edwin, and his eyes had just as much fear as Peter's had. He had tears in his, and as I stared at him, those tears welled up and spilled out onto the damp floor beneath him. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Colton, oh God, I don't want to die. We'll be okay, I whispered. But I was so ashamed of the obvious lie that I didn't even speak it loud enough for him to hear. The creatures were already coming, their razor-sharp legs scratching on the floor as they raced towards their next meal. I could feel tears dripping down my own cheeks as I listened to them growing closer and closer, 
and I knew, in that moment, that we would both die like Peter, eaten from the inside out as we could feel the things devouring us alive. I shut my eyes this time as they swarmed towards us, expecting to feel those insect-like legs crawling across my skin, but nothing happened. Instead, my ears were assaulted by the tortured shrieks of Edwin beside me. I squeezed my eyes together tighter as the screams grew and grew, hearing the pain and suffering inside them until they were ultimately cut short in a pathetic, desperate choking that faded out to silence. And then, I was alone, surrounded by corpses on either side of me. I couldn't hold back the tears, and it was like the dam had been broken. I bawled my eyes out on the floor as the creatures feasted next to me, and I could do absolutely nothing. I couldn't escape, I couldn't fight, I knew I was next, and I was petrified. When I finally opened my eyes, I messed my pants. I was facing Peter when I opened them, and I found myself staring right into the eyes of one of the creatures. It was covered in red, and I assumed it had crawled up and out of the man beside me, and my breath caught in my throat. I could feel my heart racing as I stared into the eyeless, toothy abomination before me, and I suddenly felt so small and so insignificant and so very mortal. Then, it shot out its tongue into my left eye. While I was little, I once burned my hand on the open flame of our stove. The pain I felt when the tongue ripped into my eye was like that times a hundred. Pure, agonizing pain shot through me, a throbbing, excruciating burning that spread throughout my skull. I think I was screaming then, but I couldn't tell. I wasn't aware of anything except the pain. Then, mercifully, my mind was overloaded and everything went black. When my consciousness returned, the first thing I was aware of was the pain. It had faded away to the side, but still burned just as bright. My whole face throbbed and when I tried to open my eyes, I only felt one open in response. My vision was blurred and hazy, but strangely enough, I still had vision. I was still alive somehow, and that realization surprised me. I turned my head cautiously around, hyper aware of the ache that still throbbed in my eye, but I saw no sign of the creature that had impaled me. I was confused. I was dazed. I could barely think straight. I think I was still in shock. And then, just like that, my chains went loose with a click. Immediately, that same cold female voice filled the room again and said, Congratulations, you have survived the game. The bets against you were 89 to 11. You are now free to go and live your life. I couldn't believe it. For a few minutes, I didn't believe it. Then it sunk in that the chains had been released from whatever clamps had held them in place, and I reached up with shaky hands to pull them off. I managed to throw them to the ground and pull myself up to my feet, but I felt dizzy. Everything was dark, and I could barely stand. I turned to look back, and I saw the bodies of Edwin and Peter still lying there, chained to the floor in pools of their own blood. There was blood where I had been lying too, but I couldn't see farther than where we were. It was too dark to see the end of the room, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to see where those monsters had come from and where they had gone. Instead, I turned back the way I had been facing and limped towards the shadows, and after a few moments, the shadows peeled back to reveal a stained, dirty wall with a narrow passage cut into it. I looked back at the bodies at the far end of the room, but there was nothing I could do for them. My mind had gone blank, and I left them there as I limped forward and out of the chamber. 
We really were in a sewer, as it turned out, and the way out of the room we had been kept in was a twisting maze of damp, dark tunnels. I probably would have still been down there, trapped in the darkness, if I hadn't stumbled into a search party by pure dumb luck. I was almost about to collapse in exhaustion after hours of wandering blindly when I heard voices shouting in the corridors and I managed to weakly call back to them. A police officer found me slumped up against the wall and I wasn't even able to speak. He called back behind him and I saw other figures rushing forward to help me, but I blacked out again. This time, I think it might have been from the blood loss instead of shock. I woke up next in a hospital, and the pain in my eye had almost completely faded. Everything felt like a blurry, bad dream, but the soft ache from where my eye had been was a reminder that it was very much real. The doctor told me I had completely lost my sight in the eye, that they had to do emergency surgery to remove what was left. Apparently, there had been a search party in the sewers for a local girl who had disappeared and the police had found me just in time. They said it must have been rats that took out my eye, that my story was dreamt up by the pain. I told them that if they could find the other bodies, then they'd know it was real, but they looked at me like I was crazy. They said they had combed every inch of that sewer, and the only other body they'd found was a six-year-old who had somehow gotten down there and drowned in the drainage pool. I'm not crazy. I know what I saw, even if I don't know what it was that I saw. I don't know who did this to me, or why, but I know that Edwin and Peter didn't die for nothing. Even if no one here believes me either, I'll find the people who did this. I'll find the game. Two brown carbonated streams dripped from the corners of Lee Beacon's mouth. His neck craned back, his head tilted to the sky as the sun reflected off his cloudy eyes while he pushed the red plastic cup against his lips and poured the remnants of his drink down his throat. He crunched the cup flat against the table, wiping his mouth and smacking his tongue against his lips. Just a sliver in whiskey in this, right? Diego and I cheated glances at each other from the corners of our eyes before returning to him on the other side of the picnic table. There was no recognition in his face, nothing to suggest he noticed our little glance or was even aware just how much alcohol he consumed already. Our plan was working. A little nudging, a little banter between young men to peer pressure the religious 20 year old who drunk perhaps only a handful of times in his life to have a few mixed drinks at the church barbecue after mass one fine Sunday afternoon. Once his taste for it was gone, each clean or weak drink packed a lot more alcohol than he thought. His tongue had already loosened, so much that it was literally dangling out of his mouth. I glanced over my shoulder back towards our church. St. Augustine's yellow rounded steeple cast a shadow that fell neatly over the area we sat and all the way to the old cemetery beyond us. We had managed to situate ourselves on the farthest bench from the barbecue, and therefore the safest place for interrogation. Kids ran around, screaming and laughing in the main area by the grill. Adults stood in clusters with bud lights and hot dogs in their hands, all of them unaware that we'd isolated their do good a golden boy and gotten him the drunkest he'd ever be. An afternoon cookout wasn't an uncommon Sunday event for the little Catholic community outside Hebronville. They had put one on every three or four weeks at least. It's the kind of thing that happens in a small community in rural Jim Hogg County. The kind of place where you know everyone in town and notice when someone skipped out en masse for the week. The kind of place where you grow up and get the hell out or stick around and waste away until you die. Diego filled another cup for Lee. It was a new one he'd had hidden on the seat next to him, with its bottom lined an inch deep in whiskey before filling the rest with coke. 
Perhaps we'd pushed the limits already. I grabbed his arm and stared at him. He shook away and turned to Lee with a smile and held the cup out to him. Lee grabbed it but hesitated before drinking. He squinted and swirled the mix around inside his cup. There's alcohol in this, he said. No, senor, Diego answered. Classic Coke. I can smell it. Almost makes me want to throw up. Only a sliver, Lee. Don't be a baby about it. Lee turned from Diego to me as if he was stuck in some kind of good cop, bad cop routine. I didn't know what to say, so I just nodded. As insignificant as the gesture was, he took a tiny sip and coughed nearly the whole thing back up. Too strong, he said and set the cup down on the table. I tried to think about how such a character could have brought himself to do what we suspected him of. How could a skinny white boy with a short crew cut neatly combed, spending most of his time at work or volunteering at the church, bring himself to commit such a crime? The Beacons were one of the most clean-cut, well-to-do families in town. Everybody knew their name. His father had landed him at the bank after high school, where he worked 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. He probably did Bible study in between chores on Saturday, before spending his Sunday helping out his dad again around the church. Could he really have been guilty of stealing the donation money after mass? Could he really have been sticking around to have his go with Sunday school girls aged 15 years or younger? We'd first heard rumours from Lee's cousin, Jamie, at a party a few months back. We didn't believe it at first. We kept hearing the same story getting whispered around in different social circles. More often than not, it was coming from people whose word I trusted. If it were true, that would make him not so different than the common local burnouts like Diego and myself. The poor kids from religious families with darker sides kept out of sight from everyone in town. It's not like we hadn't grabbed our fair share of the donation money before. We were out late, car hopping, and chasing around the handful of girls left our age who hadn't ditched town after graduating. The difference was that we hid in the dark. Lee was hiding in plain sight. Our crimes are petty. Our rambunctious exploits legal. We drew a line in the sand and stayed behind it. It was Lee who we originally saw as the monster. Not ourselves. Lee finally took another sip of his drink, either by choice or the alcoholic content slipping his mind. A group of the Sunday girls ran by us, holding hands, before circling back to the main group. Among that group was Lee's 11-year-old sister, Lily, and Diego's sister, Martine, who just turned 15. Diego had become convinced that Martine had started acting strangely once those rumours started surfacing. He said that she would come home after Sunday school and lock herself in a room for the rest of the day. She was lethargic when she finally showed her face on Monday morning, like something was clearly hidden beneath the surface. Lee shielded his face from them while they passed, like he couldn't stomach the thought of seeing his little sister witness him drunk. I wondered how he would like it if some other older boy was staying late to swoon over his little sister unaccompanied after Sunday school. I don't look drunk, do I? He said after they'd passed. He had reached the point where he felt comfortable confiding in us. That was all the evidence we need to know we had him where we wanted him. Not just because he was unaware of his obvious gloss over eyes and word slurring, but because the thought of two Latino delinquents across from were actually his friends. I checked over my shoulder again to make sure we were still out of sight and out of mind. Not much had changed. The same kids played over by their parents, adults still chatting amongst one another. Father Gamazi made his rounds with his hands on his stuffed belly. He always made sure he had a chance to chat with everyone. Even Mr. Beacon laughed with a beer in hand while he stood over the grill. I tapped Diego on the knee. It was time to extract the information. So, Lee, Diego said. I hear you're still spending most of your Sundays around here. Never bail out like the rest of us. Lee pressed the tired face into his palm. 
his head tilted from side to side. Volunteering my whole life. Probably will take a bigger role like my pops pretty soon. But you're 20 now, right? Not like you're gonna have a whole lot of fun. You must mean to other things outside work and the church. My faith is my life. But what do you really do? I interjected. It's just a small church. Can't be much work. Not enough for you to hang around for hours every Sunday. There's lots of work. Have to clean up after mass, get everything back in order. We've got to organize the events. We've got to work, meet with Father Kamazi to make sure everything is running smooth. Diego was starting to clench his fist under the table. We don't think you're just sticking around to help. You've got other business you're taking care of. Only church business. Think I'll go talk to my dad now for a bit. He's stealing donation money? Diego interrupted, his voice now much firmer. That's what your cousin Jamie told us. Lee burped behind his fist. His eyes shifted between Diego's and mine. His legs started to bob up and down under the table. Never stolen a thing. That's not what we've been hearing, I said. Apparently you've been up to other stuff as well. Been creeping around with the girls after Sunday school. No, never. Why are people talking about it then? I... I don't know, he said and tried to stand up. Both Diego and I jumped as well and with our forearms pushed them back down. If you've got something to confess, I recommend doing it now, you roach. Diego said from beneath clenched teeth. His eyes were opened wide and furious. A look I'd only seen on his face a few times before where the end result was always catastrophic. Lee visibly shook all over. I noticed his eyes finally leaving ours and darted over our heads. Behind us, Father Kamazi and the other devout volunteers were headed past us and towards the church. They had the entire Sunday school group behind them. Lee took the opportunity to save himself. He shot up and ran over to them, a fake smile and a hand visor over his eyes to shield his impairment from them. Kids are in need of a little Bible thumping, Mr. Beacon said. Lee gave a thumbs up and kept his eyes on the ground. He stayed with them all the way until the church doors were closed safely behind them. Diego got up and started to walk after them. He wasn't going to stop until I literally caught up to him and held him back. I'm gonna kill him, he said. Not here, you aren't. Where? Where? Maybe we can get him after work outside the bank. He brought daylight right on Main Street for everyone to see. Where then? This tight-ass piece of dirt rarely leaves his house for anything but work or church. Exactly. So we'll catch him red-handed in the act. No one will be around when he's stealing the money, let alone waiting for the girls to leave class. This way... We'll know for sure. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go now in peace, my children. May you find beauty in the day as the Lord intended. Father Kamazi made the sign of the cross, pressed his hands together, and bowed his head. The pews, all filled with the good Catholic folk, shifted one by one and slowly got to their feet and headed towards the exit. I lingered on the tattered cushion kneeler, my parents and all the people around me stood up to adjust their belts and Sunday dresses. I peeked out the corner of my eye to see Diego doing the same. His eyes were closed in front and his hands pressed together. Whatever thoughts circulated inside his head, they were surely not that of prayer. His parents guided Martine out from their seats and out towards the main hall. It wouldn't be long before she was in the classroom. Four weeks had passed since our interrogation at the barbecue. We decided it best we wait before taking action. September had come, and Dallas Cowboys talk was filling the streets, homes, and even the after-church discussion. We hoped the lapse in time would be enough for Lee to let our little confrontation fade into the background of his thoughts and let his guard down. Just long enough for him to feel safe and get back to the same stuff we knew he'd been pulling. The agreement between Diego and I was simple. There could be no excess of bodily harm unless proven, either by confession or by action, directly witnessed by us. If he gave us either of those, 
we'd be the ones that serve him justice. The police could ask him questions later. The Beacon family passed up Hugh, one of the last families to leave, as was their routine. Lee didn't look around or shift in any way to make me think he was uncomfortable or suspected anything. He splashed some holy water on his forehead and left the nave with a stupid grin on his face. I looked at Diego again who nodded back. We both got up and followed them out. We carried out some meaningless conversation out to the main foyer and mingled with the crowd. We stuck around and chatted like we always did. All the while, both our eyes constantly darted towards Lee, who had stationed himself by the main doors and shook everyone's hand who would lend it while people slowly trickled out. Diego's family finally wandered over to mine and we joined the conversation. Our parents joked about how they'd both managed to raise such lazy young men who were still hanging around the house and hadn't yet managed to land themselves full-time jobs. We both smiled and played along, knowing they would faint if they knew even the slightest semblance of who we were in our private lives. The things we had done already, the things we would do that day, not the good Catholic boys we were intended to be. Diego started our pre-rehearsed story and told everyone that we were headed out. We were going to drive back to his place and play Madden until the actual game started at 1. His parents would be out of town visiting his grandmother that day, and Martin wouldn't be back until 3pm when Sunday school ended. We'd allowed ourselves more than enough time to get our job done and get back before anyone could suspect us. Diego had even left the TV and Xbox running in his room as if it would serve sufficient evidence we'd been there all along. We headed out into the parking lot and into Diego's silver ram. We sped out of the parking lot and down Country Line 17 and back towards his house. He pressed hard on the gas, trying to put as much distance between us and everyone else as he could. When we were safely out of sight from any car, he pulled into one of the side roads and then off into a little wooded area. There, we waited patiently, chewing tobacco and dragging cigarettes while the familiar churchgoers' cars passed us on the way back home. None of them, with any reason to suspect, the two young men had pulled off the road. We couldn't wait too long. We had to head back before Lee had time to do... whatever it was he was going to do. Go, I said, and tossed my cigarette out the window. I was pretty sure that everyone had already passed. One of the advantages of living in such a small place but you could recognize everybody's car. Diego turned the engine on and started us back towards St. Augustine's. Neither of us said a word for that portion of the ride. The old vehicle creaked and moaned as we sat in silence. We were focused only on the task at hand. Diego pulled the truck off the road before we reached a lot and steered us behind some bushes that ran along the back of the cemetery. From where we were, we should have been totally out of sight from the church. Ready? Diego asked. Ready to keep you cool? You know this asshole is the bad guy, right? You don't have a sister, but try to imagine hearing stuff like this about yours. We don't even know if it's true. We do, though. It's just talk. That slimy guy talked enough at the barbecue, and he'll talk again when he feels this blade on his throat. I looked out through the shrubs and towards the fading yellow bricks of the church. Remember the rules, I said. No killing. Don't use anything that will leave a trace or knock something to the floor. Diego turned around and started rummaging under the back seats. Anything else? He said from over his shoulder. Just wait for the proof. Diego returned from the back with two black masks, along with two sets of black gloves to match. He also had a choice of weapons. Two crowbars, three rusty old knives that he probably found in his parents' garage, and a massive pair of bolt cutters you wouldn't need both hands to use. He even had an old potato sack to choke him out. I held my breath as I looked over them. I'm serious about this, he said. Consider this your proof. We moved slowly at first. We crouched, carefully placing each step in the dirt like they were watchmen on patrol. We ducked behind crumbling tombstones, picnic tables, and any obstacle along our path until we reached the back doors. 
We paused below the rectangular shaped window they connected. It was covered with a thin transparent curtain that could easily be seen through from the other side. I reached up and gently tested the handle to see if they'd been left unlocked. They had been. And why wouldn't they? Who would suspect anyone trying to break inside a church less than an hour after mass had ended? It took us a little while before we felt confident that no one had noticed us and slowly brought our heads up to peek inside. Lee was right in our crosshairs, directly in front of us in the main lobby. Seeing him so immediately was so startling I nearly toppled back. He couldn't have been more than 20 feet away. Broom in hand, he swept towards a pile of dust and debris in the middle of the hall. His head was down. Whenever he turned enough to one side, I could see his expression was serious, like something was on his mind that wasn't cleaning up. Diego pointed to the near wall. Leaning against it were a couple of church posters, a mop he'd probably used after sweeping, and the two collections baskets he'd been tasked with safekeeping. Both of them overflowed with the bills of the well-intentioned Catholics. Lee swept a bit more into his main pile, scooped it up, and dropped it into the garbage can next to his loot. He leaned the broom against the wall and wiped his forehead with his arm and turned back towards us. We were one step ahead of him. We both dropped well before he could have seen. All he saw through those windows was the same old picnic area with the old cemetery behind it. I prayed Diego's truck was out of sight as we'd imagined. After a few moments of silence, we gripped our crowbars tightly and slowly brought our eyes to the window line again. Diego's fingers shook and slipped on the edges of the pane. Had Lee still been looking, we would have had no choice but to rush him and create more commotion than we wanted. A very different looking Lee was now standing in the foyer, one like we'd never seen before. He looked towards the classroom farther down. He had his hands clasped together his thumbs circling the insides of his palms. He slunk along the wall towards the door, tiptoeing as if afraid to disturb anything in the empty space around him. He made his way to the door of the Sunday school classroom and gingerly brought his head to the window to peer inside. He spied on them while we spied on him. He stayed there for a while, lifting one heel off the ground and then the other, then someone must have seen him. He quickly jerked his head away and then crept back to the spot where he'd just been cleaning. Both Diego and I ducked again and looked at each other while under the window. Think he saw us? I said. He didn't see anything. Hope so. Enough proof for you now? Peep and Tom just got caught looking at the Sunday school girls. He glared at me. I could see his long-held frustration starting to boil over. I looked at the crowbar in my hands. I tried to imagine what it would be like to crack it down over that sicko's head. It didn't feel wrong. Not in the slightest way. Diego was first to make a move. He stood up and deliberately pulled one of the doors open. I got ready to lunge up when it squeaked, but saw no reaction from Diego. When I got up, I saw that Lee had vacated the foyer and moved into the kitchen area the next room over. The doors flapping closed behind him. The mop and broom were left leaning against the wall. The collection baskets, gone. I tried to tug at Diego's shirt, but he pulled away too quickly and tiptoed as quickly as he could towards the kitchen. The bolt cutter stuffed around the back of his pants nearly fell to the floor. I had to jog to catch up. Lee was still totally unaware after we slid through the kitchen doors and crept up behind him. He stood in front of the sink, splashing waves of running water up at his face. The collection boxes had been set neatly on one of the tables behind him. Had he been caught sneaking by Father Kamazi, or even by his dad? Had he tarnished his precious Beacon family name? Soon he would tell us. That was, if Diego didn't kill him first. Lee's head perked up like an animal, aware of his predator at the very last second. He made a half turn, 
before Diego brought the crowbar down and landed it in the area between his neck and his shoulder. I pulled the sack out from under my shirt and drove to force it over his head as quickly as I could. Diego got a few punches in as I leaned over him, making my voice sound as rough and distorted as I possibly could. I leaned down close to his head and spoke as quietly as I could. Not a sound. You make one scream for help and it ends for you here. Do you understand? Lee's head nodded from under the sack. His nails scraped along the tile floor like he was trying to find some traction. Diego brought his crowbar down on his right and I swore I could have heard the sound of bone cracking. We pulled him into the farthest corner of the room and out of sight from the doors. He punched wildly into empty air as we sat him up in one of the wooden kitchen chairs. He must have known. Who else could have done this to him other than two criminal delinquents who tried to force information out of him only a couple weeks before? Diego hit him a few times in the midsection with his crowbar. He recoiled, taking the blows, and screamed into the sack one last time before I punched him right in the gut as hard as I could. The tiniest, most painful exhale escaped from under the sack. Diego took the bolt cutters out that he had around the back of his waist. He looked at me and nodded, and I knew there was no amount of anecdotal rationalization that would convince him out of what he was about to do. He put the blades on either side of Lee's pinky finger. I went around behind him and put one arm over his mouth and the other over his chest to keep him from squirming. I felt his mouth open wide into my hand. The sound barely went more than a couple feet. The crotch of his pants got all wet and he struggled with whatever strength he had left inside his body. It was a smooth motion, easier than I thought it would be. Diego pressed the handles together with all his strength and Lee's finger cracked and bent until it was severed and laying on the floor, twitching in its own pool of blood. He thrashed harder than before. He kicked and tilted to either side so much that he pulled both of us over. On the ground, Diego punched him over and over in the chest and the head. Lee kept fighting until he was too damaged to continue. His kicks and screams became weaker. The blood still poured all over the floor and soaked the legs of our pants. It was over. Whatever wrong that Lee Beacon had done, an evil justice had been served. I pulled myself to my feet. My arm hurt so badly from the fall. I staggered by Diego, who looked like he was ready to jump back in and strike him again. Blood had gotten on the inside of my pants and up my leg. My first instinct was to pull off my mask and wipe it. If only it would have proven my biggest mistake that day. Somewhere in the pain and the adrenaline, a realization struck me. We weren't the only ones in the building. The Sunday school group, Father Kamazi, and even Lee's dad and some other volunteers were still in the building somewhere. I stumbled back out into the hall and looked back to the right and out the back doors. Nothing out there had changed. I could even see bits of the silver paint from Diego's truck if I looked hard enough through the shrubs. I turned back to my left, fully intending to collect Diego and starting our mad dash out the building. I stopped dead halfway around. Sarah Beacon stood outside the classroom door. She had one hand on the handle and the other clutching the skirt portion of her purple flowered Sunday dress. Two thick stream of tears rolled down her face. Her watery eyes sparkled under the fluorescent lights above. She'd seen us. She'd seen what we did to her older brother. I could tell from the look she gave me, she'd witnessed something far more terrible than any young girl should ever be exposed to. She was trying her best to hold it back, but she was on the verge of breaking and crying out for everyone to hear. What would Diego do if he saw her? Surely he wouldn't be so keen to let her go. Not now that she'd see my face. He would intervene. He would hurt her, take her captive. Even worse, depending on how much adrenaline he still had coursing through his veins. He might even kill her. I gestured her towards the classroom door and started to pull the mask back over my face. Thinking the day would come where she would point to me as the guilty party from a courtroom stand 
in front of my family and half the town. I was alright with that. I had already done all the damage I was going to do that day. It was better me than her. She winced and turned the door handle. The door slammed shut behind her and echoed through the hall. I went back inside and grabbed Diego by the shoulder and both of us ran as hard as we could all the way back out to the truck. We were out on County Line 17 and back at Diego's place in half an hour, watching the Cowboys game without anyone except for Sarah ever knowing. Pebbles cracked and split out from underneath my tires. The truck bobbed up and down when I pulled off the road and into the little flat behind the bushes, now 18 years overgrown. They stretched nearly as tall as some of the old trees behind the graveyard and completely blocked my sightline of the church. I parked in nearly the exact same spot that Diego and I had all those years ago. I had the day of my return penciled on my calendar for longer than I could remember. I was as ready as I was ever going to be. Lee Beacon died from his injuries the day we beat him and cut off his little finger. There is no escaping the fact that never a single day will pass where he doesn't pass through my mind at some point in time. Sometimes I see his face, flushed red with mixed alcohol beverage running down the corners of his mouth. Sometimes I see his nervous face while he peered in through the window of the Sunday school classroom. Sometimes I simply picture what his face must have looked like under that sack after we struck him over and over. I opened the door and stepped onto the dirt and scattered patches of grass. I wondered how long it had been since someone had stood in that spot. Perhaps it was the police who scoured the area after being called unseen. They never traced any tire marks in the dirt back to Diego's truck, even though they arrived at the church approximately 35 minutes after we'd left. Neither Diego nor I served a single day in jail for a heinous crime. We never even dealt with the slightest bit of suspicion, nor were we on the radar in any capacity. This was due, in large part, to the fact that Lee was not the only murder victim found inside St. Augustine's church that day. He was only one small piece to an even greater and perplexing atrocity that occurred within the holy confines of that building. The whole thing was so big, so shattering, that any trace of us would have only become an irrelevant detail in the grand scheme. The South Texas heat was hard to readjust to. The air was sticky, and I was already sweating by the time I reached the old graveyard and walked in between the tombs, not kept up, and now nearly 20 years further aged. I stopped in front of the Beacon's graves. They were the last two to be buried in the yard. Lee was 20, and Sarah only 11. They were too young to be taken from the world. Both of their blood forever stained upon my hands. A surge of sadness engulfed me. I had to turn away. I had to put my hands on my knees, trying to suck in long gasps of air to slow my heart rate. I looked towards the church. Its formerly yellow bricks were chipped and browned. The windows were mostly boarded over, except for a few spots where the slats had been peeled off or cracked. The back door, the same one we'd peered inside to see Lee spy inside the classroom, had been replaced by two large steel ones, forever chained and bolted shut. Perhaps if we'd gone to prison, then I'd have the chance to make peace with myself. At least I'd be able to accept the fact that I made the conscious decision to beat Lee to death and deserve to spend the rest of my life in jail if not the electric chair. I had a chance to save a life immediately after taking one that day. If I'd done something when I saw Sarah Beacon outside in the main foyer with my mask off and tears spilling down her face, she might still be alive. Of course, at the time, I did think I'd saved her by ushering her inside the classroom before Diego could discover that she'd seen my face. Those tears in her eyes were not brought on by witnessing what we did to her brother in the kitchen. She may not have even seen us at all. She cried because of the fate she knew she awaited inside that classroom. In there, she fell at the hands of truly evil men wearing more devilish masks than Diego and myself. The police arrived on scene, not because someone had discovered Lee's body and called them. 
They arrived after a tentative call had been made before we'd even pull the truck into the spot behind the bushes. It was a seemingly harmless call about the idea of potential wrongdoing inside the classroom made by none other than Lee Beacon before we got to him. Lee wasn't guilty of what we thought he was. Quite the opposite was true. Lee was the one person who knew about what was really happening behind closed doors to the little girls and boys at Sunday school. He wasn't staying late to pocket donation money and make his rounds with girls underage. He was staying late, trying to stop something terrible from happening from the same men who manipulated him his entire life. It's only coincidence it all happened the same day that we came for him. All 12 children's bodies were found, strewn over the carpet of the classroom floor. Their little limbs lay at the sides or flopped over little plastic chairs. All of them showed signs of some form of physical abuse, noticeably worse than some, before ultimately dying from the same poison in their veins. A half-full pitcher of toxic fruit juice was left sitting on the teacher's desk. Father Kamazi and Mr. Beacon, the two most devout members of the church, were discovered on the altar. They were later found to be responsible for what had taken place that day. They were blamed for the children's murders as well as beating Lee to death. Spilled plastic cups of the same drink were found next to their bodies. God gave me a chance for redemption that day. I could have saved Sarah's life. Maybe I could have saved them all. Instead, I was only there for murder and fled like a coward the moment my life was in jeopardy. There will be no forgiveness for me.